here. Summer there. Yeah. All right, welcome everybody back from summer. It's good to see everybody. And um, <coughs> I'm going to call the meeting to order at 8.35. And we'll open with the flag salute. Please join me. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Board agenda approval. Um, before we do that, Craig, did you have any comments to make about the agenda? Yeah, we had a few uh, changes to to make here. Uh, first of all, we are not having closed session this morning. That was just an error that was on one of the um, announcements. Uh, let's see here. We will. We need to pull the um, the consent item. That is about the board assignments, so that's 5.3, and uh, do that separately, vote on that separately, just because we, ha we had to shift around um, trustees Leong and Lou's uh, schools. And then the HDD discussion today, it's listed as discussion action, but we are not taking action today, so that will only be a discussion. We don't have to move it. It'll be fine to leave it there, but it'll only be a discussion. And then, <coughs> uh, Jerry, I didn't know, you, you said you might want to pull one other one, I think. Uh, yeah, I, did, did you want to do that? Actually, we'd like to pull 5.1 and 5.2, please. 5.1 and 5.2, yes. okay. So it, really, that means we're pulling all, we're just going to treat each consent item separately, which means we can leave them there, but we will address them one at a time. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, Lori, did you have something? No, I was just going to move for you. Okay, go ahead. Yep, okay. So I'll move um, the agenda with changes as read. Hey, is there a second? I'll second it. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we have a, a changed agenda. And uh, we'll move to communication employee organizations. Do we have anybody here? No? Okay. And uh, public comment. Any cards, Renee? No. No, no public comment. So we move to consent, which is no longer consent. It's now individual items. So 5.1, approval of the agreement, um, maintenance and improvement of open space areas. Jerry, did you want to start with this? Did you yes. have a comment? Sure, uh, around 5.1. So, <clears throat> so first of all, I want to thank uh, Jeff for answering a lot, and Craig for answering a lot of my questions. And um, I think uh, uh, Jeff was up pretty late last night pulling in some final numbers. I just want to appreciate that for the extra effort. Um, so for 5.1, I understand that to be an update of the joint use agreement with the city of Cupertino for field use, and primarily it's about extending the hours at Kennedy and Hyde, and as well as the rebate for the storm um, tax, storm drain tax. Um, I had, I guess, a general intent question and a couple about the contract itself. Uh, the, the issue <coughs> I wanted to sort of raise here is it looks like with this contract, what we're doing essentially is outsourcing the maintenance of our, these fields to the city. And I wanted to understand, do we have the capability to do that in-house? What's the, what's our, you know, what are we managing right now? What are we sending out? So just at a level of intent, um, is this what we want to do or are we looking for something different in the future? So I th think to start off, what we have right now with our grounds department is we support nine of the fields. Uh, we support all the grounds on the in entire campus, so all 25 school sites, but we only manage nine of the actual field spaces. So where the joint use agreements come in for both Sunnyvale and Cupertino, they manage just the fields, which is where the storm drain fees were coming in, because since they manage the field, they lease out the field, they're covering a portion of the cost of the field that they utilize. In terms of what we can do, our staffing reflects the current work. And so our, our if we were to take over um, the fields of that Sunnyvale and Cupertino, it would have an increase of staff, but it wouldn't be for the full amount of staff because we have grounds that already cover 25 schools. They just don't cover the field, which is why it's a little bit of a lower number that I was sharing with you yesterday, about <coughs> three or four total FTE. Certainly we would have to add some equipment costs. Um, so there's one-time costs and then there's uh, personnel costs, which would be ongoing. Uh, the other other piece of it that we want to make sure of is is that we can do a really good job taking care of field. We've cut so much back over the years in our grounds and maintenance side just because of the, the situation we've been in fiscally that it actually makes sense for us to invest some money back into it 
because at some point if you continue to pull money away from your grounds maintenance department you, you could potentially leave yourself with more money needing to be spent because you're not doing the the regular upkeep that we should be doing and so one of the things that we're focused on this year is is the nine fields that we are managing is to increase our budget for that a little bit so that we can get the the field a little bit more um, kept up I see um, all right thanks um, this, this <coughs> parallel item was on the Cooper team uh, council meeting on Tuesday but also on the agenda. it was also pulled for discussion so um, I guess with regard to contract there were a couple of things that jumped out at me you know um, just in summarizing so if you look at the preamble the goal of this agreement is to you know provide uh, good learning environment for the students, uh, open use for the community, uh, saving on at, um, operational costs for both parties. Um, but then I, I look at these specific terms, and there are a couple of things in there where, um, for instance, to build on anything that's not marked as capital improvement, um, to add any sort of improvement over $20,000, we need the approval from the city. Um, the Right now, the control over how we water the grass is complete. It, it, it says it's done according to Cupertino Municipal Code. If you look up that code, it has one sentence. It basically says that directly the public works can do whatever he wants. Um, and so there are a number of things like that where they, they con and, and we're the ones paying for the water, right? And so it doesn't, and I don't even see how that fits into maintenance. And it just seems like there are a number of terms in there that, I don't know, I'll just maybe, sorry for being flippant, like we fought a war and then we lost and this is the <laughs> agreement we ended up with where it's our land, but it seems like you can't really, we need their approval to do all sorts of, what well, seemed like, like I have less rights than a basic homeowner. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering, is this the same with Sunnyville? Is, like, how did it get this way? And I'm not looking to, I'm looking for more historical <coughs> context than anything because from the discussion at the city council meeting, they brought in Lawson and Sedgwick and, you know, Roger Lee talked about, oh, the district's got union situations, and I realize there are probably things I don't know, but I wanted a little bit of context around why the terms like this. It seems very, uh, you know, unfair to us, I guess. Yeah, can, I, can I just weigh in a little bit? I, I do want to tell everybody that our hope is that we can have conversations this year through the two-by-twos with Sunnyvale, with Cupertino, with everyone, um, and so from our perspective, this particular item is not precluding us from having those conversations and they are aware that we feel that we need to address some of these issues. But th this is a, uh, this, the agreement we have in place right now is another 10 years, I can't remember what it is, right? So it's it, it, 2032. <coughs> right, so, so it's there for quite a while. So um, th th this isn't, um, re-upping that, it, it's actually providing us some security on a few areas that we have not been able to have while we're working on it. But we have an out, and we can talk about this this year. Um, that can be the goal, which we'll talk about during committee conversation. So I, I just, I just want to make sure everybody's aware that this isn't, we're not entering into a new agreement that takes <coughs> us into something that, oh my gosh, if we agree to this, we're in trouble. It's not that way. In order for them to get started, in order for us to get our programs going, we had to improve what we have, and I think everybody's well aware that we're going to be working on these things. And so to answer the main question, th it's slightly different, I think, with Sunnyvale, but the, the basics are there, that um, they maintain the field way, way, way better than we do or can or have um, in exchange for certain things. But if it is going to in any way hinder our ability to run school programs during the day and somehow that doesn't take precedence, that's not okay. So we're gonna work on that and that's what we really have to change. Right? I just wanted to surface this issue. I, I understand and, and to be clear, I understand that we've already agreed to these terms. So however this vote goes, these terms are there today. But I think it's one, um, I'll just mention at the council meeting, Mayor Sharp did ask the staff was there anything that the district wanted out of these agreements? Because they, they want to, they want also the use of Sedgwick and Lawson. The answer was I haven't heard anything that the district, what else the district wanted. So I'll just mention that as a statement of fact, but yeah. uh, thank you. I, I, I don't like the terms here. I'll, I'll <laughs> go along with it uh, for now, um, but I, I hope we can maybe discuss whether or not um, how we want to um, look at these agreements. Because it, I'll just add one other thing. Um, so right now, I think we're looking at the benefits of school. There's a lot of benefits to the city. We're contributing close to 40 acres of open space um, to a stock of about 160 in the city. Um, I, I ran the calculations myself. It turned out it was written there in the general plan. Without the contribution of the land from CUSD, 
Uh, the city of Cupertino actually can't fulfill its own um, standards of you know three acres per thousand residents. So I think there are things we contribute to the city also, and I just like, yeah, we should discuss that with them. Right, thank you. Yeah, and again, for everybody, just know that when we get to the committee conversation, this is that's the kind of thing I want us to talk about to say so in those two by twos or any of the committees, whether it's enrollment, facilities, whatever it is, what are the things we think we need to address this year? And so we can talk more about specifically what kind of terms do we want to work toward? And we'll do that later on in the agenda. Can I ask a, a clarifying question about that? So if a city is managing the fields and then they, like my only personal experience is like my daughter's softball team at Kennedy, right? Like do, do they charge, who charges for that? Who makes the money off of that or is it free use or? So uh, I'll just, uh, since I've been burying myself in numbers and uh, <laughs> Satish is smiling because he's one of the people who write the checks for the software. <laughs> um, so basically any fee that's collected for use uh, goes to the city to help offset um, the cost. So uh, last year they've been estimating a revenue of 135,000, okay? Um, their estimated cost for maintaining those nine fields is 1.1 million. Of that, they assigned 4.3 FTE, so it's about 600,000 for personnel, another 380 for materials, and they have this system of system allocation where they allocate overhead across, they allocate another 200K. So it comes out to the stated cost for maintaining those nine fields is 1.1, and right now they're taking in 135. So these are the these are the numbers from their 1920 adopted budget. So they're making money. No, they're not. They're making far less than their. They are making far less. One could. Yeah, but they have, they have staff assigned to other parts, and that, so there's just an allocation of 4.3 uh, FTE, if you look at it that way. That's, that's what they're, and then another three, 400K for, you know, seeds and fertilizers and what have you and all that, you know, the costs, so. But those fees go to the city today, um, yeah. And they determine the fees, like we have nothing to do with that's that. That's correct, yes, they handle all that. Any other questions or comments on this issue, Lori? I'm just going to make a comment since we have this item open, um, and I guess it's it's partly just directed to echo back to what Jeff just said about adding a little bit more back into our budget. Um, I've shared, I think, with Jeff in the past, but definitely one of my concerns when it comes to our fields is there's an equity issue as well. Our school sites that um, are not part of one of our city programs, um, you know, have significantly um, <laughs> less usable um, green space in, in, in many cases. So, um, you know, just as a, an adjunct to a wider discussion. So this, um, do, we, we, do we have a motion on this? No, no we okay. don't. We need a motion on this one. Um, <coughs> so what is expected here, actually, out of this? Because we I think this is still a lot of, uh, I think, unanswered or, or to be decided kind of things are there. Well, it sounds to me like what we're being asked to do is to approve this agreement with future discussion about how this might be altered or what negotiations might happen with the city in the future. Do I have that right? Yes, and, and this agreement, the only thing that's changed, that we already have an agreement, right? Correct, with correct. The, there are only a few changes that help us because they were unaddressed before. So we have already addressed some that we felt we should. So it's all to our benefit with an understanding that we will be talking with uh, cities about this this year. And so we're asking for approval of this because it actually benefits us. Um, uh, yeah. Then I think we should have a motion, right? To con yeah, we have to. Right, so, so this is a two by two committee will take it up, we'll right? That's what it is then. That's my guess. That's the recommendation. Okay. We'll talk about that during um, uh, agenda. When we talk about I mean, uh, board advance. So Satish, did I hear a motion? Yeah. From you? Yes. Okay, and is there a second? I'll second the red line. All right, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries 5-0. 5-2, similar, this is also a memorandum with the city of Cupertino on another topic. So right. Jerry, so you wanna hit this one? Right, so this one is about the rental of some of the facilities at Lawson for a teen center. So I guess, I'd, uh, so currently Cupertino has a teen center in the Memorial Park area. So I'm, I understand this is a second teen center they're looking to open at our facility? Is this what this is? This was actually a pilot program that started last year okay. um, where they're looking at getting a teen center on one of our middle school campuses. Uh, Lawson certainly was the school that they chose, but the location of it, 
um, the need at the school. And so the pilot was deemed successful last year. Um, actually, uh, Stephen Kaufman was, was working with the city on this last year. They came back to us this year and said they'd like to try it for another year. Uh, Lawson, both the principal and assistant principal, liked having the program on campus, thought it was a benefit. And so what we're bringing you today is to extend that for another year. Um, and then, of course, we're going to be checking in, is it successful for our students, is it successful for the school? It's a one-year deal, and then we can always bring it, bring it back, and we can always consider adding an extension to it, um, <coughs> should it be successful again. And just if I may, the, the rates that they pay are tied to our current fees. So you were asking about the city fees. We have use permit or external use permit rates. There's really five categories. We call them four categories, but there's a 1A on it. Those rates are something that we actually are going to discuss this year, if, if those rates are uh, representative of what the current costs are. Uh, but they fell into a tier. Uh, the tier, it's a very clean process from the standpoint of where um, an outside partner vendor falls on our pricing chart. So my, my question is um, currently um, the rules at the King Center for the City of Cupertino is that it's free for Cupertino residents, but um, non-residents have to pay a fee. I'm wondering, um, in this case, if we had Sunnyvale CUSD students who came to use this King Center, would they be subject to this fee? I, I actually reached out to the city after I got that question. Uh -huh. My understanding is there's no charge for them. Okay. I had not heard back yet. So when that does come back, I'll, I'm happy so to email you guys. Our this. current understanding is that, um, I understand we hear back from them, our current understanding is that it would be free for all CUSD students, regardless of what city they lived in. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion on this? We don't have a motion on the table. Let's get a motion on the table first. Do you feel like we need clarification Could on that uh, point? Uh, Let's get a motion, Lori, protocol, before we, we continue have, we discussion. A, we, we, we've been kind of off protocol right. um, with these things. We're supposed to do a motion, a second, then we discuss it. So, right. Yeah. So hold your question. Let's get a motion on the table. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second it. Okay. So now, Lori. Do you want to wait to get clarification on that CUSD student? No, I, I think um, I, I don't like to hold things up. I think certainly there's been a pilot there. Although I'll just say I wouldn't support this if we treated the students differently across CUSD. Um, I, so I'm voting yes on the understanding that um, there isn't a fee for any CUSD student. But if we're going to start segregating people by where they live, I'd like to revisit this. So I guess I want to clarify a couple of things like uh, any even the field usage also non cupertino residents have a different fee even as an organized sports when you are doing if you are a resident you have one charge and if you are a non-resident it's a double okay so but i think i presume here uh, this is specifically in the school and they cannot treat it differently but uh, organized sports could be advertising across uh, the uh, you know area and people could be c coming in from other places as well okay i, I think what, where i'm coming from is for organized sports they're essentially paying market rate and so they rent it they can do whatever they want with it the rate we're charging, $10 an hour, I understand it's on a fee table, but that can't be market rate. I, I can't go rent a birthday party. I mean, I, I just, if you were to rent the teen center from the city of Cupertino at the nonprofit, the lowest rate, it's $70 an hour. That's how much they charge nonprofits. That's the lowest fee on their fee table. So this is one seventh of what they're charging, and there's far less space. But I'm, I, I, I support this because I think this is a service we want for our students. It's just that. You know, later we're going to talk about CSD 25. I, I, I'd like to help build this identity that we're one district, not a collection of schools. And if we start charging things based on you're from this or in that area, it seems to me to be a step backwards from CSD. That's terrible. Yeah. So I just Great. wanted to clear that, that it, it would be available <coughs> based on all the CSD students. But, but anyway, I think uh, these are some of the things that cities protocol. I think it'd be hard for us to influence them, other than probably yes or no on giving that, I guess. Oh, I hope there's room for negotiation, but right, I, the vote would have to be yes or no, but I, um, it's $5 a day, you know, I, anyway, yeah. I, so. I agree with you completely. Yeah. But so, J Jeff, you're following up on what the, you're, you'll follow, or Stephen will follow up on the response it, to It would the be question. Michelle and myself, but we, I had emailed earlier this week and I hadn't heard back right, as of today. Right, but you're following up. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, uh, yes. If I could, uh, this, it feels to me like this is a one we should amend and say we, that the motion, if we could ask for a friendly amendment, the motion is to pass it with an understanding that fees will be equitably charged across for all of our students in some way. If we find that's not true, then we have to come back, right? I'm happy to offer that friendly amendment. Okay. And I'll second that motion. No. Okay, so did you get all that, Renee, the amended motion and everything? Okay, good. So we're ready for a vote. All, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? 
Okay, 5.2 carries. And now we're at 5.3 school board assignments. And I think that's you, Craig. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm school board assignments. Oh yeah, so the school board assignments, uh, simply when we uh, switched uh, Jerry and Sylvia's, um, we only switched the middle schools, but it was supposed to be the whole set of schools. So we just wanted to clarify that we are, um, it was that whole set of schools. So the elementaries that go with those middle schools that we shifted uh, also go with you as well. And just wanted to make sure that was clear that uh, what we were doing. Okay. Okay, everybody good with that? We need a motion for, um, School board assignments. Is there a motion? I move to approve the new amended uh, assignments. Okay, Jerry, uh, a second. A second. Sylvia seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. A discussion: community savings through refinancing. I believe that's you, Jeff. Yes, it is. Can, well, I, can I ask one quick question? Can you just send out an updated list so that we have it in case anybody asks? Thank that you. Will do. Okay, perfect. You mean of our assignments? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Sorry to stop the momentum. <laughs> okay, Jeff. We have a representative from Piper Jaffray, Tim Carty, who this board has seen a few times this past year. One of the things we always look for is any opportunity where we can take a look at our bonds and, and refinance them for a benefit for our community. And so what we're presenting to you today is a potential refinance for a previous series of bonds. And so what Tim is going to be able to take you through is what is the potential community savings and what the plan is if that's something the board would like to follow up on. The process is a little bit simpler than what you approved earlier when we had a resolution brought where we went out for funds. This is a little bit of quicker turnaround or it can be a quicker turnaround I should say. Um, it does it would take a follow-up resolution if you do want us to move forward with the with the refinance. So with that said I'll turn it over to Tim and then there's room for for questions during it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam President, members of the board. It's nice to see all of you again. If this is everyone coming back from the summer, and I'm the first presentation. I'm going to try to be energetic here and get everyone uh, in the mood for uh, for your day today. Um, so as, as Jeff described, uh, one of the things historically your board has always been very interested in is whenever there are opportunities to refinance old general obligation bond debt and save money for local taxpayers. And as a matter of fact, when I did my last presentation before you a couple of months ago, we talked about that. And at that time, we talked about the fact that at the moment, it did not look as though there were any bonds that were eligible to be refinanced, but that we would keep our eye on it. So we've kept our eye on it. And Jeff and, and Dorothy and I have, have met and gotten together because what's happened in the last two or three months is a couple of things. Number one, we've seen a nosedive in interest rates to where we're at Dwight Eisenhower era levels in terms of interest rates caused by a number of things. Federal Reserve lowered rates. All the trade uh, tension, tariffs, is there a recession, isn't there a recession, all of that has contributed to further reductions in interest rates. That's number one. But the other thing that's happened is, if you remember, and, and we talked about this at, at my last session with you, when federal tax reform took effect, January 1st, 2018, it took away the most common type of refinancing opportunity for local government, which was issue new tax-free bonds to refinance old tax-free bonds. However, interest rates have gotten so low that now we can issue taxable bonds to refinance old tax-free bonds and still achieve savings for the community. So the combination of a general nosedive in interest rates that's occurred over the last three or four months since we were last together combined with the fact that that's happened with taxable rates creates an opportunity that we wanted to share with you this morning. So I have a few slides, and again, whatever the proper protocol is, I welcome questions, dialogue, discussion, whatever I Would you I like us to interrupt with questions or wait until the end? Whatever, your call, Phyllis, whatever works okay. best. All right, I guess we'll just ask as we go if we have questions. Whatever. So the first slide I've got here, Dorothy, arrow down to change pages or arrow across? 
What's the best way to change? You can scroll. Scroll. Yeah. Oh, scroll. Okay. It's my fault. Yeah. Okay. So this is, let's scroll a little bit farther. Okay. So this squiggly line is the current state of affairs with regard to interest rates. Now, if you'll notice, I updated this a couple of weeks ago as of August 6th. If that were today, this squiggly line would even be a little bit lower. And it's now eclipsed over the last 10 years what were the dead lows of the summer of 2016 before the presidential election. And really, if you look at, if this went back farther, we're really into almost the late 1950s in terms of where interest rates are. And just like that's motivating any of us with a home mortgage, a car loan, to refinance, same thing with regard to um, the indebtedness of local government. So that's just a little snapshot of the general level of interest rates. So let's look at Cupertino Union School District and our inventory of bonded indebtedness. So this is the inventory, and I'm going to scroll to right about here. So we have a number of bond issuances that are outstanding. And when we would have met last three or four months ago, nothing at that time was shaded in yellow. So we do, if you look at the top, we have some bond issues that the remaining balances are just not prepayable by virtue of their terms. And then if you look at the bottom, we have some, for example, the, the newest bond issues, the ones we did in 2016 and the one we just did six months ago, where there are no savings available. But then we've got now these bond issuances that are striped in yellow, where there are savings available. And one of the things that I'm going to show you a slide in a minute about bonds that's different from a home mortgage. Well, the mortgage, you either refinance all of it or you don't refinance it at all. With bonds, you can refinance portions of them. So we can select certain maturities that have savings for taxpayers and refinance those. And if there are other maturities that don't generate savings, we can leave those alone. So the bond issuances in question, there's a total of five of them, where today, if we were ready to go, there are savings available for taxpayers. And I'll talk a little bit more about what Jeff mentioned. With a refi, it is a more streamlined process than issuing new bonds for funds. It can be done more quickly. When you issue new bonds for funds for projects in Santa Clara County, in addition to your board taking action, the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors also needs to take action. That's not the case with a refi. With a refi, it's more of a direct route to the school board. So if we look at this today and we like the idea, this could be consummated within a couple of months, whereas a new bond issue for funds for projects is more of a three-month or so process. So those are the five issuances that we are looking at. Now. I mentioned that one of the good things about bonds and refis is it's not all or nothing. So I'm going to scroll up to here. So these are the five issuances, one, two, three, four, five. And what we've shaded in green was let's start with the red. The red maturities are the ones that are not prepayable, just by their legal terms, not prepayable. So we leave those alone. What's shaded in green are the maturities where there are savings. And you'll notice that 5% coupons, okay, more 5% coupons, more 5% coupons, more 5% coupons, 4% coupon, 4, 3 and an eighth, 3 and a half. So if you think back to that squiggly line slide where we showed the current level of interest rates, pretty much anything right now three and an eighth or higher has the opportunity to save the community money. The reason I shaded a couple of other maturities, the five percenters here and the three percenters here, is they are maturities that if it were today might not have savings, but in the next month or two, by the time we get around to sell, they might. And one of the things as a board, when you adopt the paperwork for a refi, 
from what you adopt, we can always go lower, we can't go higher. So what we often do is we often ask a school board to approve a bond package that's the highest amount we might possibly refi, knowing we can always kick out maturities and go with a smaller package if that's in the best interest of the community. So as we sit today, the green I think we would do, the blue we probably wouldn't do today, but if rates keep going down, the Federal Reserve, for example, is meeting today. There's talk about another quarter of a point interest rate cut. Maybe that happens. So these blue ones Sorry. might suddenly get a I just, if you can move just a little bit back. Should I mind. stay at the microphone? If you don't okay. mind, thank you, Tim. All right. <coughs> My apologies. So um, anyway, that's just to show you the current universe of maturities under consideration, the ones green that would be in the package today, the ones in blue could be in the package in the next month or two. And this is not uncommon for us to try to, in what we present to the board, give you the largest universe possible, knowing we can always slim it down if we need to uh, when we're in the marketplace. And those are just the legends, green bonds currently eligible, blue additional bonds that could be refinanced if interest rates drop further. So this now is what I would call the basics, the 40,000 foot view of the refi opportunity. Again, it's similar to a home mortgage, replacing higher interest rate debt with lower interest rate debt. The delta between the average interest rate on the old bonds, those ones in green that we just looked at, and current rates, if we were in the market right now, you can see it's sizable. It's almost two and a half points, right? Almost five to almost two and a half. The number one question that I get asked from board members when there's a refi, are we extending the term? And the answer is no. Under state law, you cannot do it. And I think just good government, we wouldn't want to do it anyway. So the length of time taxpayers would be paying on the old bonds if we did nothing, that's the same length of time they will be paying on the new bonds if we refi. So right now, the current basket of bonds eligible to be refinanced is about $136 million or so. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about this concept, but just hold the thought that when we refinance, the amount of new bonds we sell is always larger than the face amount of old bonds that we're retiring. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but just hold that thought for a minute. There's about another $11 million in bonds. That was the blue, that if rates drop further, we might add to the package. Type of new refinancing bonds, taxable. That's in accordance with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, what I call, quote, tax reform, that took effect January 1, 2018. So even with the new bonds being taxable, which means if you're an investor, the interest you earn, you would include on your federal and your state income tax returns. Even with taxable bonds, we still have savings. Now, what's the magnitude of the savings? I'm going to scroll a little bit more. So right now, the third bullet from the bottom, there's about 15 million, all close to $15.5 million in cash savings available to local taxpayers. The second most common question that I get asked from board members is, is that net or do we have to subtract out transaction costs? That's net. There's, there are transaction costs whenever you do a bond issue. So that's net of my estimate of what those costs might be. Now, I'm going to get into the weeds with you a little bit here, but I think it's important for a full understanding. $15.5 million in cash savings over time. If we took the present value of that today, What's it worth? It's worth about $12.2 million. And why do we look at that? There's a little bit of a unwritten rule of thumb for local government. When is it worth it to do a refinancing? Because we wouldn't do a refinancing to save $1 or save $100 or save $1,000, right? It's not worth it. It's not impactful. So there's a little bit of an unwritten rule of thumb that if you can save at least in the neighborhood of 5% net present value savings, it's worth it. Now, some local governments, even at 3% or 4%, will still go forward. But certainly at 5%, it 
if you asked the County of Santa Clara, or the State of California, if you asked government agencies that are frequently in the market, when do you refinance? Any local government would say 5% net present value savings is a clear go. So at where we are now, we're at almost 9%. So I share that with you. The other thing I want to share, just again in terms of giving you a full understanding of a refi, one of the things about bonds is, and I'm going to go backwards just a touch here, um, when you refinance a mortgage, the day you refinance is the same day you pay off your old mortgage, right? Take out the new, pay off the old, it's all done in one day. It's a little bit different with bonds, okay? So the bonds, the five series of bonds striped there in yellow. They can't actually be prepaid. In other words, the investors who own them can't actually be cashed out today. If you go to the red, some of them are prepayable August 1 of 21, some August 1 of 22, some August 1 of 23, and some August 1 of 24. Now, we can refinance them today, but the old investors don't actually get cashed out until those dates in the future. What's that mean? That means when we refinance today, we sell the new bonds and we put the money in an escrow account. And the escrow account is going to pay the interest on those old bonds up until the date when they can be cashed out and then cash them out. I'm going to interrupt you for just a minute. We're, we have a bit of a time crunch. And we need some time for discussion with the board, so okay. Um, I don't know. If Am you I can going too the slowly? Salient points for us. And um, okay, let me. Th I, I may be, be getting a little too much. And then we'll have here. an opportunity for them to ask you questions okay. as well. Okay. The re okay. The reason I went into that a little bit is for two reasons. Number one, that's why if you look at that fourth bullet, whenever we issue new refinancing bonds the amount is larger than the face amount of the bonds we're refinancing because we got to cover the interest up until the payoff date. That was one thing. And then the other thing is sometimes a board member will ask the question, um, what if we waited? Is there any downside to refinancing? And the only theoretical downside, that's why I included this negative arbitrage, is if we waited until 2021, 2022, 2023, and interest rates stayed just as low as they are today, which most of us would think they're not going to do, but if they did, that negative arbitrage, that's the amount of additional savings there would be if interest rates stayed at the level they are today. So that's the only reason I, I diverted a little bit. I think most of us would think interest rates have got to go up at some point. $15 million is a lot of savings to the community. They're going to appreciate that. We shouldn't try to get too cute and outthink ourselves. But that's the only reason I diverted a little bit. And I'm almost finished. Uh, mechanics of refinancing old bonds, this is what we just discussed. Refinancing can be achieved in 2019. The old bonds get prepaid on those dates, 21, 22, 23, 24. We set up an escrow account. The escrow account's invested in United States Treasury securities. So the old bonds go off your books. The taxpayers don't get taxed. The auditor doesn't include it as district debt because we have an escrow fund that's going to make the payments. And I'm down to three last slides. What would this mean for a typical homeowner in the district? Okay. The median assessed valuation, I don't quite have the new one yet, but as of last year, the median assessed valuation was $826,000 and change. Not the market value, the tax value, the assessed value. So for that home, it's about close to $300 in savings. You can see there's some savings every year. That's per 100000 in the right. So for an $826,000 home, you have to multiply it by 8.26. This is also a proof that we're not extending the term. 
You see the length on the old bonds. You see the length on the new bonds. So I wanted to show you that. Um, this was just, we've done refinancings in the past. $23 million in savings has been what we've achieved over the last several refinancings. If we added another $15 million onto that, we'd be up $38, $39 million as a running total. I wanted to show you that. Um, what we've done in the past is we've always done a press release. This is an example from the 2016 refi. I think you put this on your website. You might have given it to the local paper. Remember, all the savings go to the taxpayers. The district, per se, doesn't get any of the benefit. We want to make sure the taxpayers know it. And the last slide, what would be the steps in the process? This is probably a little bit dated because I think, Jeff, you indicated if the board wanted to, we could have documents for your approval at the September 12th meeting. Then we'll work to get our credit ratings reconfirmed. But this could be done where you see sell new re refinancing bonds. It's currently blank. But that could be October or November. And then the tax bill that comes out in October 2020, that would be the first time the taxpayers would see a reduction. So why don't I stop there and then open it up for okay, discussion. Okay, so I'm going to open it now for questions to you. Are there questions for sure. Tim? Lori, and then, yeah, Lori, go. Okay. Um, so presumably there is a cost to us, the district, in, in pursuing this. Does it get rolled into this, or is this coming out of our general fund in order for us to do this? Great question. There are transaction costs. They're rolled into the financing. Okay. So there's no cost to the district. And let's say we started the process and the market moves. Yeah. The savings evaporate. No harm, no foul. We put it on the shelf. You don't get a bill from me. You don't get a bill from the lawyers. That So it, all the costs are self-contained within the bond package. Jerry? Or, or just to follow up on that. So basically, you don't get paid unless there's an issuance. If it goes up and we pull the whole thing, then we just shake hands. We just shake hands. <laughs> and if the savings evaporated, it would be my duty to recommend okay. we pull. All right. right. Just, just wanted to double check. My, my question was, you mentioned that these new issuance would be taxable. Yes. I'm wondering why, what keeps it from, uh, from us from being able to issue non-taxable ones. Tax reform that took effect January 1, 2018, eliminated okay. the ability of local government to refinance bonds unless you're within 90 days of the payoff dates. Remember those August 1, 2021, 22, 23, all of that. So unless you're within 90 days of those dates, which we're not, um, you can't do a tax free. Just a change in the law. And I'm just scrolling back to find those. Yeah, these dates. Na within 90 days, you can. Prior to 90 days, you can. Any other questions for Tim? Okay, th Jeff. Oh, sorry, I'm just, we, oh. we couldn't see the camera, so we yeah. have to make it a little <laughs> bit darker here, I apologize. Oh, okay. So this is a, uh, was only a discussion item. We're assuming we're bringing it back, that we have to pass a resolution? Yes, so if the board is agreeable, I think, Craig, on September 12th, we would bring a resolution authorizing the issuance. We would bring an offering statement very similar to the documents you would have seen earlier in the year when we did the $15 million under Measure H. Um, and then we would go as quickly as possible to get into the market, come back and report back to you, hopefully good news. So if it's agreeable, Jeff and I have already, and Dorothy, had a phone call to get the attorneys ready to prepare the documents for September 12th. I just wanted the board to know that if you're going to have issues, you should let us know. Otherwise, we'll just bring it. I would just action. like to hear if there are any, does anybody have any issues with this? No issues. Okay, I think we're good to go. All right, thank you again. Thank you. My pleasure. Appreciate it when you come down and visit us. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks, Tim. Sure. Okay, and next we have 6.2, an update on district facilities <coughs> currently not being used for K-8 instruction. Can I set this up a little bit while you do that, Jeff? Yes. All course. right, so um, over the course of this year, uh, staff would just like to bring different bits and pieces of information that relate to some combination of facilities and enrollment, which as you know are things we're still working on, um, and so that when we're ready to dive deeply into it, you have a 
a bunch of information leading up to it instead of us jamming it all into one time and having to make quick decisions. So one of those is we just wanted you to be familiar with all of the properties that we have in the district that are our assets. Um, and uh, to start thinking about, we're not making any decisions, we're really just understanding what we have and starting to think about how might we best utilize our greatest uh, assets, really, other than our people, our, our properties. So um, hoping we can just engage in a conversation, throw out ideas, uh, again, no decisions, just ideas, and then we'll bring that back along with other similar kind of conversations over the course of the year. Okay. okay. Thank you. So as Craig was saying, we focus so much on our 25 school properties, but we don't often have the opportunity to talk about the six other properties that we, we lease out or other properties that we retain in the district. And so the focus really has taken us through what those properties look like, the location of those properties, getting some direction on potential future use of those properties as well. Um, so the properties vary in use and size across the district. Some are properties we've had for over 30 years. Some are a little bit newer. Um, we, we have some use that's currently happening with them. We have certainly a number of leasees at three of the six properties. Um, and then we're we are looking for guidance on a couple of the properties that are not currently in use, as uh, Craig was saying. So what are the six properties that we're referring to? So we have Finch, Sarah, our district office, that's over on Vista, Nan Allen, Montebello, and Luther. And so w with this presentation, because there's, there, there's questions that can come up, this can be very dynamic. We can jump back and forth between slides. Please interrupt at any point and, and ask those questions during it because I think it might be helpful uh, to have that dialogue back and forth during it as well. So just very quickly, this is the breakdown of the number of acreage on the properties. As we, as we talked about earlier, th there, there is differences in the size of those properties and certainly differences in what the use on those properties could be based on those actual acreage. So we'll, we'll hit on Vista first just because it, it obviously was the location of the district office before the Lawson Field expanded. I'm not going to walk you through every single picture, and, and if you need me to pause a little bit, I can. But the, the biggest picture I'd like you guys to focus on is the first one here, where that, that very top picture represents where the original district office was when the Lawson Field needed to expand. The district office, which is why we are here in this building today, was pulled off of it. So you see the distance of where we, the district office was really almost on the street, so to speak. There's a parking lot in the district office, and that would have fulfilled the whole area of that track. Um, behind it is where our maintenance and courtyard is. We have our, our white fleet um, and all of our buses there. Our, our current use, these are the departments that are housed there. Give you guys a chance to review that. Soon nutrition often comes up as conversation. Last year, the board had the opportunity to go to our central kitchen located on Stockholmeyer's campus. But as we shared with you at that point, our refrigerators aren't there, or our freezers. And so those are located at the back of the warehouse on Vista. Can you tell me what OMR is? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. O OMR is, we have two spaces there that are conference rooms. Um, they can be one larger room of about 1,100 square feet, or they can be broken down to two smaller rooms. Uh, the acronym sometimes. And then this is a big picture of what the site looks like. Um, you see the track area behind the track area below the tennis courts. If, and what was That's the, the actual... What I'm was sorry. the old district office? Right on the track. Yeah. Just the old district Just office would have right. been at the bottom part of the, the loop of the track where the cardio exercise equipment is currently located. And at that time, there were no tennis courts? There were no tennis courts. The field was uh, actually an awkward shape. The field actually went this way across the field. Right. Um, very small. It's actually our smallest middle school field. It, it, because it used to be an elementary school, it was conducive for an elementary school, wasn't conducive for the 1,000 or 1,100 kids that were currently going to Lawson at that time. Is the, when we talk about the, oh, sorry, are we interjecting questions in between? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, when we talk about the, the total acreage, the 4.73 acres, does that include the racket courts and the track, or no. is that just where our maintenance and fleet and all of that is? Good question. It does not include any of the space that's for Lawson. Will you just draw your finger around the what's your the four point something acres? Comes out that field goal pole and then it expands out into this area down to the bottom. Of the Perfect. Street. Thank you. And the parking lot going and over. The parking lot coming yeah. this way. Thank you. Uh, and the okay. parking lot coming this way. So you kind of take the L and move it from here all the way up because it's all Lawson. Uh, I'm sorry, to here. 
all the left side of that black line right here sequence is the bone. And then that finger that goes up. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Is the tennis court maintained by us or it's a city's? How is it? The, the tennis court? Tennis is it, courts? Is, yeah. it, yeah. is it maintained? Is it maintained by Lawson? I mean, it, it's part of Lawson. It's, it, not it's part of Lawson. It's, it, it's yeah. part of Lawson Middle but School. But with an agreement that the community gets to use it, isn't there? Our, our community can use any of our fields. It, it's not currently leased out for any use, but you know, families use the fields certainly all the time, including the tennis courts. I, I just say, um, for full disclosure, didn't the tennis club or somebody help pay for or raise or tennis players raise money? No, it actually came from a private donation at oh, that time. Got it. Uh, I'm sorry, 50% of it came from a private donation at the time, along with the PTA at Lawson that paid for the other piece of it. So next one we're going to talk about is Sedgwick. This is the most recent property um, that uh, was acquired by the district. It's right next to Stockholmire Elementary School. I want to get more to the map of it, but just right now it is truly a completely open lot. It's been demoed. The house that was on there uh, remediated. Oh, I'm sorry, Sedgwick. So this is Sedgwick. You see where the dot is? The green area there is, is their grass field play area. Sedgwick has the smallest field play area, grass area, for out of all of our elementary schools. And the Finch property, and I'll move over to it, actually on Google Maps it shows it still has a house in the upper part of the screen. <laughs> so when you saw it in the first picture, that's all been demoed. All the remediation had been done on it. So it is truly a an open space right now that, that the board can help us decide and, and guide us on what that potential future use can and be. And all the soil analysis and all that stuff is already done, right? It's all completed, yes. So just a historical perspective, what was the board's reason for acquiring that property when we acquired it? Because it was available and it was a pretty good price and it was adjacent and we, at the time we had a kind of a laundry list of things we might use it for and, um, and it was, uh, the price was right. And I would add that I believe the history also, that property was what led to Sedgwick too. It extended into that area. So it was, it was all a connected parcel at, that, at one point in time, I believe. Yes. So just a couple currently unused need to identify best use um, aspects of this. So we talked about the small field space. It is a potential spot where we can mitigate potential Valco impact should they grow. We could build on that area. An example could be a TK through third grade area on that area very easily, as well as extending the field so they'd have enough play space, as well as enough classrooms. So that's one option. Uh, shared collaborations, uh, space, professional learning. Uh, Dr. Baker's talked a lot about having a community-wide uh, place where we can share, but also for our staff. Obviously, for, a, for our district where we have 900 teachers, 1,700 plus employees, finding a space that's large enough to gather our groups is, is very challenging here. Um, and then it allows for potential partnerships with other agencies. If you have other potential options for us, love to hear those um, and, and something that we can explore. We can also come back to this if you want me to continue on. So, so currently it's, it's completely being unused yes. and cannot be used without improvement. For, for even for uh, organized sports or anything, you can't rent it out. Is it so? Yes, we could technically rent it out. I, there wouldn't be a use that's there for it because it hasn't been, there's no grass on it to play for uh, after school sports or anything. It truly is a, a, it's a blank campus right now. Can you remind me what the uh, enrollment at Sedgwick is? I believe current enrollment at Sedgwick is between five and 600. This is six, I think. Five, six, dropped oh, there a little bit. Okay. And then mitigating the potential Valco impact. I'm just trying to remember what neighborhood Sedgwick is in, like because where what are the bigger cross streets? You have Phil Lane that goes across one way, and then you have um, uh, uh, no. Uh, I'm oh. sorry. Uh, it's on the I'm other blank side. Right. It's like Blaney, and it's it's. Oh, Tan Tantau. Thank you, Phyllis. Yeah. Uh, Tantau is the large cross street, and Tantau runs all the way down. Um, it's actually one of the areas where traffic safety comes up a lot and one of the areas that we are hoping to see improvement based on what the city council passed. It's a very long run without a lot of stop signs, um, without it's a lot of stop with it. It's also across the street from Cupertino High School. 
This is, a, this is actually a better description or a better showing of it. So you see Tantown on the right side of the screen, you see Phil Lane up at the top of it. Again, Tantau runs the longest out of all those streets. And to answer your question a little bit more, I think we had identified the three primary sites closest to the Valco potential um, building were Collins, Collins obviously, yeah, Faria, uh -huh. and Sedgwick. I think those were the main ones. Those were, yes. Yeah, that we had said, well, maybe we could figure something out, which is one of the reasons we're kind of holding on to any bit of property right. we have because that's an unknown for us. Okay. No, I remembered Collins being the main one, so I didn't remember that it was Sedgwick. That's too. where it's zoned right now is, is Collins. Okay. That's right, yeah. Do we need to pay property tax for all these things, or how does it work? For we own, government own, kind of? Yes, it's, it's all tax exempt. Exempt? Yes. So Luther, Luther's one of our older properties um, located in Santa Clara. Currently it is leased out. Um, what this breaks down, you, it, I know it's hard to read on this, but you have Happy Days, that's on the bottom of the screen, Sierra School, Waha Montessori at the top, and then Morning Star. Uh, current, uh, currently, this is what the the school looks like. It does need some upkeep. It is something that I know is coming up in our facilities master plan conversation. Asphalt's one of the biggest areas. Luther certainly ha um, has some challenges with that. But overall, the rest of the school has been maintained. And I haven't driven by it in a while. Does, do you still have those big storage containers on the campus at Luther? We do. Okay. We do. They're pretty ugly. <laughs> By the way. So in the, they are pretty ugly, I agree. <laughs> On the bottom of this picture, uh, those are actually the picture of the storage unit. It's right next to the parking lot. Yeah. Uh, we have about four right now. They are fully filled pretty I'm much. Sure. Yeah. So when you say lease, it's, it's like a, it's a long-term lease or uh, it can be bro broken? or uh, our, our leases actually there uh, are within one to five years of expiration. I believe three of the leases, I don't know if you have that handy at all, Dorothy, but I believe three of the leases expire within the next year. Do you have the years? Um, and then the potential lease I just want to call on the bottom is for the Cricket Academy. We've been trying to work with Cricket for a number of years and finding a location that would be suitable for them to have matches. And Luther has come up as something that they have high interest in. So there's potential that we would bring this back to you as a contract to engage with the Cricket Academy to actually do field work, which would actually improve the look of the area. They would maintain it, um, and we would bring you that contract potentially by the September 12th meeting. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Um, on the Google. Here's, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah. On this image, on the Google Earth image, is all of the sort of brown <coughs> up in the top, sort of left-hand corner and diagonally above the field, is that part of the parcel? It is. It, it actually is an area where we have currently kept um, soil. It, 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 Chips, all, all those things are kept in the upper part of it. Okay. It's a large field. It's a large uh, field space. Very big campus. And it's an eyesore, to be honest. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Very, yeah. You should drive by it. We should all drive by it. I've, I've been by the front half. I just didn't pick up on that being on the back till I saw the it, it would be worth driving by the back half of the field. Any other questions on this one? Okay. Montebello. It was really hard to find pictures from Montebello. I actually took Dorothy and Hila up, and we, we took pictures of it, which we'll show you next. But to actually find the breakdown of it, this was the best picture we could find. It's a very, very old. It used to be a single house schoolhouse. Uh, we actually have some employees in the district that once worked there. It is filled with portables, with most of it, with the exception of you see just the corner of the roof there of the original schoolhouse that was there. It is very pretty up there. Um, we have tried leasing it out in the past. The, the challenge with it is the drive up. So when it's been leased out to programs, they don't typically stay there because it is a little bit more dangerous drive. You are going up quite a bit. It's about 15 to 20 minutes up the road when you start climbing the hill. It does take some time, a lot of turns, um, but it's very pretty when you get up to the top. That house is a historical yes. monument of some kind. It is. The schoolhouse, the original schoolhouse is considered historic. Uh, so we've looked at potential leasing it out. Those haven't been sustainable at the current time. Uh, consider selling, consider use as a professional learning center, which would require us to build on it. Um, 
we have talked about storage of records to Phil's this point there's never a great spot to store the stuff we we need to that is a potential location for it as Craig and I talked about it'd be a very expensive spot to store stuff from the standpoint of you have this huge or nice gorgeous piece of land and you're storing desks and chairs and stuff there so there the use is something that you know again guidance from you on, on what potentially we could do there um, another thing about thoughts? that site is parking parking is challenging parking is challenging yeah, we'd have to build. So it would have to be built into anything that we did um, if we consider use as a professional learning center like how would what would that look like just to give me an idea of what that means like what like does that like staff retreats so is that like like staff learning days or like what is yeah does that and mean? or you know a lot of uh, people have their annual advances and retreats with their administrative teams or um, you know it'd be like a mini conference <laughs> center essentially where people could go they could rent it out um, so yeah we're, we're, we're starting to think about partners that might want to do that with us uh, that if we're providing the land maybe they could do that with us and we could all share it for you know going back to maybe we can get 200 people in a room or or probably more than that um, it's a nice nice space so uh, we haven't done a lot of thought on it but that is one of the things uh, that we've thought about if you type in the address in a Google Maps it actually gives you the wrong location so this is the location you see how the the acreage is spread across in a diagonal way that is a hill that goes straight down towards the front of it so this area here it does go straight downhill uh, on the back side there's actually a hill that goes up the property as well so it's a, it's sort of narrow in terms of what is truly a usable space Nan Allen is located on the back side of Collins Elementary School it's where we have our teacher resource center um, and where we have kit stops, so that's where the science kits have been currently put together. Uh, the one building that is still there uh, is leased out. So the, the pictures go across, the TRC and kit stop are the first building picture, and then if you look right below it, the brick building is the building that we're showing the layout for on the previous slide. The building is very, very cool looking. Um, it's in fairly good shape as a whole building, and there is play space in between. There's play space in between where the top two blue roofs are and where the, the map dot is for Bright Horizons. That is, is open space. So that's where the size of the acreage comes into the total uh, land that is there. And then Collins Elementary School being in front. The portables that you see that you see in that area is current classrooms for Collins Elementary School. Oops, sorry. So the, this is the current use, and it is fully in use for Teacher Resource Center, Kit Stop, and Bright Horizons. Sarah's breakdown, again, the, the, they have portables on there. Uh, it is fully leased out. We have a Montessori Early Horizons French American currently uses that Harmony Dance Center and then the city of Sun Sunnyvale primarily uses uh, the field that's there as part of the joint use agreement that we have with the city of Sunnyvale the location of it the the back side of it the lines of what are ours and what becomes Sunnyvale are a little bit harder to see but it is a very expansive park and, and property when you really take into account Dolls Avenue, Hollenbeck, and then the front of the school on, on, Lu on Lewiston. I would, I would just point out on Sarah, I think um, Early Horizons has been there the longest, and just to get a sense of it, they've been there almost 40 years. So it's a very long, I think it's 37 years, number, something like that. Um, and Delora has been there almost a lot. So long-standing community uh, folks uh, who do serve our uh, many of our own students, et cetera. So it's a, uh, and they've all been there quite a while. Uh, French Americans a little more recent, right? Yeah. Uh, Dorothy just pulled up. Eighty-five is when they first started being there. That's a, that's a few years. <laughs> <laughs> I will turn it back over to you with with. Uh, framing it with three questions any questions thoughts and then future needs 
what we did is include some of the conversations that have both come up from the board, from us internally, from working with our, our employees over the years. So revenue enhancement strategies that are associated with the lease lots. Uh, employee housing, uh, it certainly is being talked about in the high school district, talk, being talked about Sunnyvale, it's being talked about in Santa Clara County as a whole. Uh, it would be good to know where we currently stand on it. Uh, a spot for a district office is still there as we are renting in the building where we are right now. And then we do need to keep in mind potential VALCO mitigation in the future. By way of reminder, we spend about 400000 a year on this, this building here in rent. Uh, so the district office is on our mind as a way to help, but that ties back to the revenue enhancement in a way, right? So uh, that's something we'll have to address at some point one way or the other. So other than this building, any other property we are renting or leasing other than we do have some offsite storage at, uh, for core data. That we're renting? We, we, it's pay, a, we pay for a, a contract to store records there. Did we do any, uh, I know that we, I'm sure like we must have done a lot of study before moving here, uh, but did we explore in past to use any of those properties for as a district office? Any of these properties? Yeah. Uh, well, we've certainly been talking about it a lot, right? So that it constantly comes up, but there's no, it, it always gets back to, do we have money? And you know, it's not in our bond to do that now. And so we either have to go out for a bond or, yeah, so right now, uh, yes, all of them, I would say at some point with the exception of Montebello, I don't think we'll uh, do that up there, but any, any other property we have, we are thinking that through. Again, that's one of the reasons we're starting these conversations now because I need you all to be spinning on this like we are thinking about all the possibilities. Back when we made the decision to, to lease this building, um, the same thing that Greg just mentioned, we didn't have the money to renovate anything to make it into a district office. And at that time, the revenue from the schools that we were leasing was higher than what we were paying for rent here. So there it was kind of the decision was kind of around all of those issues to move here nobody was very happy about it nobody wanted to lease really but um but it was kind of the best solution at the time which was what like five years ago maybe now or a little more maybe, maybe more you're through the first five year lease seven right? years now. Yeah. yeah so seven years yeah so i just have a comment i am pretty passionately opposed to selling anything so i would not uh, be a, in favor of selling anything but i think all of these options that um, the staff has suggested to us are are good ones. I think that certainly moving the district office makes sense if we decide at some point we want to go out for a bond to do that. I would hope the community would support that. And teacher housing, as you all know, was a pretty hot topic in this district a few years back, but um, maybe it's time to revisit it. We're hearing about it all over the county, all over the state. It's a huge need. So. Anyway, any other discussion? What would you like to say about this, Lori? So I had kind of two thoughts that, two kind of cliche phrases that kept going through my head as I was reading all this, which is sometimes you have to spend money to make money. And so I would agree with you that, um, you know, if there is ever a justifiable reason to, you know, go out for some money in a bond that would help us with, um, you know, getting out of this district office lease as well as maybe opening up other revenue enhancing opportunities that seems like a um, worthy and long sighted, um, you know, potential view for us to take that would, in, you know, benefit our students. Um, you know, uh, the other was that, um, like many families here in the Valley, we are, um, you know, sort of house rich, cash poor, as they say. And um, I would absolutely echo what Phyllis said. I think one of the wisest decisions our predecessors back in the 70s and 80s ever made was to hold on to every piece of property they could at the time. We wish they'd held on to more. Um, <laughs> so the thought of selling anything at this point is, um, to me, something I couldn't support. Um, you know, it's having those parcels is what allowed us to open some of our alternative programs. It's what saved um, the places in the district that we may need to address capacity or we have addressed capacity over the years, like Stockelmeyer and Collins. Um, and I guess to your um, point about employee housing, um, housing is a, a, a regional problem and um, it's gonna require a regional solution. Uh, there is always the question of does a school district have any place in 
um, sort of the, the local housing inventory issues. And I think what weighs on me is, you know, school districts are some of the largest employers in a community. And um, so I think both from that context of, of our employees as well as um, what it does for kids when we are able to attract and retain um, high quality staff are reasons why, yes, there is an argument to be made that school districts have a place in being a part of, not the sole, but a part of a regional housing solution. Um, you know, that said, we are lucky to have such a, a, this is one of those cases I think where our very large school district that sometimes um, is such so challenging for us also could benefit us in this and that we have a lot of space to spread out on. It doesn't have to all be at one site if we're talking about housing solutions. And um, so I guess I would be in favor of at least exploring if our part of that contribution to sort of this, you know, uh, house rich, cash poor sort of um, conundrum isn't, you know, the land and if there are other partners that could partner with the funds to do something about it, maybe it makes sense for us to um, look for partners to put some of the bill for what we do have, which is the land. I know there are school districts like Los Altos that would kill to have our land, so <laughs> maybe that's the wrong word, but um, you know, but uh, being able to look bigger than maybe even just our immediate school districts right here and, and look at um, you know, what's out there. I think also the one other thing I would say on the subject of regional housing is a lot of the other local school districts around us that we compete with for staff already have these programs. Santa Clara, Mountain View's in the process of developing one. Um, Palo Alto just partnered with the county on one. So, um, you know, there are other school districts that are already ahead of us on this game and um, it can be just maybe one other way that we're helping to make CUSD a place where our staff would like to be. So. Um, those were my thoughts on all of it. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, I'll, Jerry? I'll go next here, I guess. So I, I think I echo the sentiment for both of you in terms of the real estate holdings. Um, I, I guess the way I put it is I would oppose any reduction in our real estate holdings. I'm not um, close to property exchanges, but I do feel we're sort of, you know, uh, or you know, it's a baton race and we just have this, sec I wanna, you know, make this place, you know, as good or better when I leave it and so I think I certainly wouldn't want to see any reduction in real estate holdings. In terms of um, in terms of the uses, um, I'm open to looking at any of these. I, my preference would be to have these sites used in a manner that would not preclude them from being used for education in the future. Um, I think one of the you now we have a strong performing school district, and I think if you look at our community, a big part of I think what people like about, other than the public school system, is the network, the ecosystem of enrichment um, opportunities there are, right? And land value is only gonna go up. It's gonna be harder and harder for these folks to sort of you know, offer these services at a price, and I think uh, at a reasonable price. And I think having us having real estate allows us um, options in either how we shape that or when we do our own enterprise offerings, um, being able to um, just offer things other than sort of what we do as a as a public education institution, um, and so I, I think my my preference would be revenue generation. Um, I agree with Lori. You need to spend money to make money, and I, I do wonder if there are ways for us to monetize this beyond just the uh, leasing of the land and property. There may be partnerships and other things we could do. Um, Valco mitigation certainly is something. It, it's not just really Valco. If you look all along Stevens Creek. There are a lot of higher density housing being approved all along Stevens Creek. So it's, it's Valco, but it's really a lot of these other ones also. Um, the, the thing on employee housing, I agree also it's a regional problem. Um, I'm open to looking at it, um, but like I said, my preference right now is to preserve the use so that, um, so that they can't be used for um, education purposes in the future. Um, I realize there, there's, it, it's, a, it's a regional problem we should contribute, uh, and there may be other ways we contribute to this. If we got involved in something like this, I almost certainly would want to see some sort of a partnership. I don't think it's something we want to tackle all alone, but I'll, I'll be honest, this is not, this is like out of the four, um, probably the last one on my list of um, uses for the property. A district office certainly gets a little, seems silly, we own all this property and then we're leasing property from somebody else. 
Um, and so insofar as that that can be worked into a future bond, certainly would be very much in support of that. Thanks. Sylvia or Satish? Yeah, I, I'll take <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I know that a lot of study was done for the housing, for, uh, you know, uh, for employee housing at some point of time, and uh, it was dropped. Okay. So I don't want to reinvent that. But uh, anyway, so uh, that happened, and we had to drop it. And uh, now this is coming back again, right? So what it changed from then to now? That's number one. And did we even consider a specific location for that? that time and if if so which uh, which of this probably could be most because by considering what uh, Laurie and uh, Jerry was also saying if you give importance to studies and other things like one of this facility for sure like uh, could be probably least usable kind of other than going to the hill maybe so so did we have any thought or did we have that any, anyone wants to answer well so the the housing project um, proposed back then, I believe, was all at Luther, and it was all going to be there, right? So what I would put out, what, uh, I, I don't think there's an appetite for doing something like that in this community, but we do, uh, we have more than any other district that I know of, especially an elementary district, we have more land, more uh, field space than just about anybody, honestly. And uh, the reality is we could talk about, well, what if we just put, you know, eight houses, not, not big buildings, not, not uh, condos, not, but on all 31 of our sites, you could just do some houses and you would significantly impact the number of employees that need housing. So um, I do think there's a way of thinking about that. Now that's different about, do we want to give up any of that land to do that purpose? So I'm not promoting that right now, but I'm saying there are other ways of thinking about it that don't have the kind of community pushback. Um, and certainly if we did this, we would spend years talking about it. It's not, I think that's part of the problem we had before too. It was a pretty rushed thing and one community impacted and it was like, what? And right, so you had that reaction. But I, I think people actually, what we hear is people really understand it resonates with people that we have to be able to attract and retain teachers and you know where do they live? And not just teachers, you know, all of our employees. Where where are they going to live in this area? It's almost impossible, right? So uh, I do think it's something we have to pay attention to. It doesn't mean we have to use our land, but we sure have to pay attention. And, and if one of our goals is to make Cupertino the place where people want to work and stay, then we're going to have to help figure out the housing situation that we have. So I'm ranting, but that's my response. <laughs> Sense. And I, to, just to respond to the other piece of your question, he mentioned that we did move very quickly on that whole Luther um, uh, proposal at the time. And um, the pushback was not in my backyard. That community just didn't want any part of it. And I think in retrospect, we could have handled it differently as a board and maybe had a different outcome. But, but the other side of it is, as Jerry pointed out, do we want to take a whole school site that could potentially be for kids in the right. future? and make 200 housing units there. I'm not sure that that's gonna be part of the discussion, but that was what it was at the time. Was it 200? Was that I think it was a couple of hundred. It was, yeah. it was over 200 it was proposed huge. in that property yeah, at that time, Phyllis is right. Yeah. And again, spreading 200 across our 31 sites, that's actually not, a, a community would not feel like, oh my gosh, what are you doing to my neighborhood? That would be, oh look, they built several houses there and that's, and similar to the other houses there as opposed to a big, um, you know, intrusive uh, set of buildings. So I, and again, I, I don't want to presuppose anything today. That's not our purpose, but I just wanted to ha have that in your minds as well. So I think that we should, I don't know how we could do this and still not be in violation of the Brown Act, but I would like for all of us to be able to take the, just to drive around and look at these rather than just seeing them. I mean, I've been to all of them. I don't know how many of you have, but I think it's important for us to look at the physical sites before we have any more in-depth discussion about what we want to do with them. Um, so uh, what can we do legally? I don't know. Can we all jump in my van and take yeah, a tour yeah. around the well, district? I was say, we can do a, one of our uh, mini but our van, you know, our little lands. Do, do we have to post it as a meeting? No, or no. For something, as long as we're not discussing business there, we're just, you know, yeah. It's a. It would be you guys presenting to us. 
right. rather than us having a discussion. Right, right. and we okay. just make sure that we adhere to the Brown Act. We wouldn't talk about um, ideas that would be voted on, et cetera. So we're could able to do Could we that. come back and have a posted board meeting where we could discuss? Yes, yes. Okay, at we the end of it, I would totally be in favor of that. I think that would be a great thing. We could also tie it to a board meeting that's scheduled that night. So if there was a, th a Thursday, uh, uh, hypothetically, we could have something where we take you around on a Thursday before a board meeting. I know that's hard with work schedules. Take you around to properties and come back to a board meeting where we have an agendized item too, and it could become a discussion that way as one option, as options. Although it takes two days to get to Montebello. <laughs> <laughs> but it's sure pretty when you get there. What a view, yeah. Did you, Sylvia? Did you have a comment? Too? We did. We skipped you. Oh, um, I, I really like the idea of some sort of conference center slash professional learning center. I'm thinking about like like some of the things I've as I've talked with teachers and, and just like the fact that that they can never all be together because there's no space large enough. And so just thinking about how it adds to the whole twenty five coalition and how um, if we were able to have like a larger I, mean, I don't know if I want to call it like an event center or something like that, but maybe like a something bigger where, where multiple teachers from multiple sites can all be together on their staff learning days. Because right now the staff learning days are so like separated and siloed, but if there's a way for like the superintendent to be able to talk to everybody all at once, right? And I, don't, I know that's probably impossible, but like at least something like more in that vein. I mean, it doesn't sound like Montebello would be the right location well. for that, but. Well, not, not for the district as a whole, but certainly for small groups it would. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, honestly, I don't think we will ever be able to build something that would house all 1,700 sure. yeah. uh, people, but we will have Flint Center and other places where we can, hopefully they're talking about maybe uh, expanding to provide that kind of space. So we'll, we'll look also. I, I just don't think any property we would have would be conducive to that. Um, that large of a gathering, honestly, unfortunately. But there are other places we can talk about. I was, I was also thinking about Flint Center and about how eighth grade graduation was there and how nice that was. And if Flint is going away, is there something? Right. I, mean, I don't know. They're talking about doing more uh, centers there as well, um, uh -huh. community center, large spaces. Um, they actually came and talked to us about that, asking would we use it if they did, et cetera. So that's something new. Okay, well, so this will come back. Everybody's in favor of a field trip. I'm Lori? I'm scanning my notes, and I had one other question. We did. We talked about Finch and Nan Allen and, oh, and you mentioned Priya were the three that were closest for elementary schools for potential, uh, if we wound up needing balco mitigation. It's, it's, it's got to be Lawson that's our middle school. W what would be the mitigation there? Is there room for We it? also have Hyde, too. So you have Hyde and Lawson that both could act as mitigating factors for uh, a project in Valco. But to Jerry's point, there is obviously a, a housing being built all along Stevens Creek, and that should that should be brought into this as well. Okay. So so is there – so I, obviously we've got the extra space abutting, abutting Lawson. We don't really have extra space abutting Hyde at all, right? No, we do. We, we could we, we could expand that campus. It's one of the things that I believe will come up from that school staff about the organization of that campus as a whole. I won't get too much into the weeds, but I know in the facility master plan, they don't have an event center, which could cause us to move some of the buildings there, potentially should, a, should you as a board decide to put a bond forward. But there is space on that campus, large fields. Okay, so when, you, when you're bringing back, you'll be bringing back to us both the big picture for the elementary school mitigation, but also middle school mitigation if if we wind up needing it yes yeah. yes okay. okay the last question from me okay. uh, so i know that a lot of people talk to me outside as well like uh, portables when you're adding it is a little bit connected to this but not a lot though so do you have some norms and things so that how we add portables or like we say that now it's all fully we cannot do any more kind of like uh, some of the schools are like you know during the summer we are adding more units right so one of the goals that we hope in the facility master plan is to identify based on our enrollment numbers, which we will we'll bring to you guys soon, is can, is there a way for us to eliminate all the portables on campus, modular buildings? With that being said, there are some really nice modulars in our district, so it's not, sometimes they end up being better than classrooms. So I want to be careful about just saying all modules are bad, but within reason, um, Kennedy would be an example 
of having too many portables on a campus that disrupts the flow of the campus versus some of our elementary schools where logically it makes sense to uh, DeVargas, for example. There's, there's four portables being put down there at DeVargas so that their kindergarten classrooms have, a, have the required space. Those portables, when they're in, I hope you guys get a chance to visit, they're gonna feel like a, a classroom. They're going to look great. They're gonna last 20 to 30 years. There's a benefit to it. So I, but if we can eliminate portables, reduce what we're paying on portables that we're leasing out, I think that would be a huge goal of, of us being um, fiduciary sound. Yeah, especially for Ria and Kennedy, um, the complaint was like we are, our green is like, a, you know, the field is reducing because the portables are coming in. So well, yeah, Kennedy is uh, very special in these regards, and I, I do think we will be having conversation this year specific to the future of Kennedy and our facility master planning. Uh, so all of this ties into that uh, at the same time. Yeah, but no doubt that Kennedy, and, and not just Kennedy, there's a few others, but in, in particular, Kennedy has some real challenges. And for you also, like there were a lot of mail discussion, like saying that we are eating up the, the green place. The field. The yeah. field. Yeah. 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 So, Jeff, I just have one more question. What What's your projection on when we will see the facilities master plan? Where are you in that process? So right now the principals are completing their survey. After the principals complete the survey of what they feel the needs are at the site, then it goes out to our engagement with the community. I would hope that uh, we could bring something to the board March, April of this year. I'm thinking once we see the facilities master plan, we might it might give us a little more insight into how we want to manage these um, six other properties. I don't know. Yeah, I, I like your idea of going and visiting them, and I also ag agree. Like I feel like I need to see what's in the facilities master plan to know what I think about. Like like I'd love to see the the cricket academy get space, but I feel like I need to sort of see where we're at with the yeah. facilities master plan to understand what implications that would have. So maybe over the course of the next few months as you're completing the facilities, that one, um, we can arrange for a field trip to go out and see those yeah. places and then maybe in the spring have some sort of a more discussion about this. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Sounds good. Okay, moving along to um, discussion, update on the fifth grade human growth and development. Do we have any speakers? Renee? Not yet. No. no. Yeah. Okay. So while so uh, I think Allison's going to do this, but while she's setting up and getting ready, I thought I'd uh, set the stage for us a little bit. Um, I want to start just by uh, catching everybody up to where we are and why we're bringing this now. Uh, a reminder that last year we had literally dozens of uh, conversations with community uh, students and staff over the course of the entire year, dozens of them. The understanding was at the end of last year, last spring in June, we were going to approve moving forward with the selection of a particular fifth grade HGD curriculum. Leading up to that, we got a lot of impassioned um, comment from uh, portions of our community. And uh, we basically listened to that and said, you know, this really is an emotional thing for a lot of people. And um, I posed the question to everybody, can't we just give parents a choice and say, if you want PPP, good. We're going to give that to your child. And if you want um, PT, we'll give it to your child and make it an absolute 100% parent choice option. The board at that time signaled, we think that would be um, the best solution at this time. Not everybody agreed 100%. It was necessarily the best, but it made sense to everyone. And, we, and so you said, we're a little nervous that is that really doable? How does a staff, how do the principals and teachers manage such a thing? You asked us to go back and make sure it's okay with them and bring that information back to you, which is why we're holding the meeting today. Um, I, I wish we had not put on their discussion action because we, uh, it is way better to give two more meetings for, uh, for us to hear from people if people still want to weigh in. But I am following through with where we landed and I have not heard any board members suggest that parent choice is not something we value in such a way that that would be a great solution that is important to us as a group. And so we are still moving forward with the idea that we would adopt two. My challenge is how do I make it clear that we're not adopting two and making one the stepchild of the other. We're saying that these are both valuable. And they're valuable from the perspective of many of our parents. And parents should get to choose which one their child will receive without it being that's the lesser or the more. Um, we remove word about default 
from the, uh, from the wording in the letter, but did not remove it from the um, executive summary, which has brought up some consternation in our community, and I understand that because it does make it seem like, oh, well then there's this, the, you know, that the better one is, the default means it's the better. That's not what we meant. So I wanna clarify, the law states that for parents who do not select for whatever reason, they forgot, they didn't do it, we couldn't talk to them, they, uh, the law states we still have to provide a curriculum for those students. Now I actually imagine almost every single student, a parent is going to select, our teachers will work with the families, we will figure out which ones are you going to do, et cetera. I don't think that's gonna be a problem at all. We will have a few students who are in this place of, well what do we do because the law says we still have to teach it. And so um, I want us to step back from uh, choosing a default because it automatically engenders a sense of one is better or more approved and that's not what we're trying to do. I want it to be 100%, nobody is forced to take a fifth grade HGD curriculum that a parent does not want that child to have. All, all the way up to even saying, I opt out completely, or I opt out of a few lessons, et cetera, right? That we're trying to create choice, not what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad. It's what's a preference that people have for their children, which they should get to have, and nobody should be forced to take any kind of a um, curriculum that you don't feel is right for your child. That's important to us. So I just wanted to recap. I believe that's where we are. Allison's going to catch you up on those items. We aren't planning to have a big, long discussion on this. We were just coming back with what you asked us to, us to do, which was bring back information about what did the teacher say and what did the principal say about it? Is it really doable? Um, and I think we want to address how might we do these, what we called default before, but that, we don't want to use that anymore. It's really just how are we going to make sure that the kids who by law are supposed to get it are getting it, um, what's the best way to do that without giving more weight to one curriculum or the other and leaving that more open. So we have a few ideas about that that we're hoping you'll discuss. And other than that, we're just giving you a report and then talking a little bit about what are our next steps here. All right, is that an okay beginning? Great. Welcome back, Thanks. Allison. Thank for the viewing audience, Allison is back to us. Yes, thank you. I'm so happy to be back, and um, thank you, Craig. I'm going to just give a quick kind of history summary on how we got to this point, and then I'll jump right into what Craig uh, laid out for us for today. So I just wanted to reiterate again that this has been, it's been such an enjoyable process. We've been on quite a long journey that started even before I joined the district. And then last fall, when we were launching our process, we committed to having a process that fully you know, engaged the community, increased communication, and committed to being responsive to the feedback that we were hearing along the way. So that's how we set out. And last fall, we put out the call to the whole community about joining the task force and letting them know where they could find the information and then all along the way, we had lots of different things happening. So we formed our task force. We had six task force meetings. We had four open viewing sessions that anybody could attend. Some people couldn't make those. We did kind of the one-on-one -on -one or small group sessions here at the district as well. We had eight parent information sessions for our fifth grade parents to be sure that they had the information they needed during the pilot. Um, along the way, we were checking in with the board a few more times. Um, and we were posting all of this on our website and keeping our staff up to date, giving our staff an opportunity to view the curriculum. So it's been a long journey, and as Craig said, one of the big takeaways is that choice is so important to our community. So today I want to explain how we are wanting to move forward with that idea. So we'll talk about how, how feasible is it to move ahead with two choices of curricula and as well as continuing the opt-out because we want to keep going with that communication that we want parents to choose what is the best fit for their child and then what to do about when we don't have that choice um, expressed by parents and then just where we're going next. So just as a reminder, the three choices within the model would be positive prevention plus and or puberty talk as the curricular choices, and then the opt-out um, option. Some parents want to opt out for all the lessons, but also parents may choose lesson by lesson, and we publish a syllabus of what will be taught 
on exactly what date at each school so parents can choose. Um, when parents choose opt out, we offer an alternate curriculum. This is true in seventh grade, a different material, of course, but also in fifth grade. It's health and wellness that are part of the fifth grade um, standards, so things like nutrition and things like that. So at the advance, thank you, Stephen, and also Craig, talk to the principals about our plan for how we might move forward with offering a choice-based model. And kind of in a nutshell, everybody acknowledged that this is really doable. And of course, yes, it will provide some challenges because it's kind of you know the logistics of making it all work but definitely it would be doable and we would need to develop procedures so that everybody knew how the choice factors would work and how we would deal with scheduling and communication but um, we know we can do that and just that communication is important for our community and also for staff so that idea of having an FAQ or a set of talking points for staff um, would be really helpful and that would be a way that we could help clarify um, lo the logistics as well as just that notion that all the choices are equal and we respect and honor each parent's right to choose what is the best fit for their child. So one of those logistical things is okay if we sent out a um, link for parents to express their choice what would we do if we didn't get it back from everybody? Um, and as Craig mentioned, when we choose to offer this unit of study in fifth grade, we, we need to ensure that we're providing it to all students whose parents are not choosing opt-out. And we can't get into the place of requiring permission. This is not that. This is just which option are you choosing. So our thoughts on that, just thinking back to the journey and what we heard from our community along the way, one thing we would consider is that a lot of times sticking with your regular classroom teacher is something that is important to the child and the family. So for the comfort factor, that would be something we would consider. Um, of course, before we even got into this, I know our principals and teachers would be reaching out to parents and you know, just trying, making every best effort to try to get that response. So this is probably gonna be a really small, if any, um, number of kids, but we just want to be prepared procedurally if this did come up. Um, so keeping the child with his or her classroom teacher would be something that would be a high priority in this situation if we just didn't have a preference at all. We might also look at balancing just operationally, you know, where do we have space in the courses at that school, or maybe we would just do a random kind of lottery situation between the two. Um, we, you know, went into this knowing that both options are strong, so, you know, we're not trying to uh, put the kids in any one spot. We just were wanting to make it work in that situation and ensure that the students are getting the unit, unless their parents have expressed a preference for opt-out. Okay, so just kind of where are we going over the course of this year in a choice-based model? In terms of staff, you know, we're in that phase of, We've shared it with the principals. They've shared it with their teachers. We want to um, give teachers a choice about when this unit of study would fit within their year. So that was part of the feedback from last year's process. So teachers and principals are working together to think about when that would happen. We're getting our um, back to school night communications prepared. We will be offering professional development for our principals in uh, both Positive Prevention Plus and Puberty Talk um, during one of our upcoming principals meetings. And we are convening a teacher team to take action on the feedback that we heard from teachers last year. This is that the minor adjustments and the improving the lesson flow, which is a standard part of any, um, when we have new curriculum. We try it out, they say, oh, we could tweak this here and there. Um, and then we would, in terms of staff, uh, once we know parents' preference, we would figure out who's going to be teaching what and give teachers an option on when they would like to attend training. That was another piece of the feedback, having flexibility so that it could be responsive to when they're going to be teaching it, as well as the many other commitments that our teachers have in terms of time. We would work with the teachers on 
customizing the professional development this year because that's a factor. You know, some were trained in positive prevention plus last year and some puberty talk, so we'll work all that out with their input. Then we'd be getting into the PD time between February and April. We'd be sure we were set with all the opt-out materials. And um, the teaching would be happening anytime after the training. We're collecting all that information <coughs> from them on exactly when it will happen, and we would be letting parents know, of course, too. So between February and the end of the year, we would be teaching and then collecting um, the information on how it went and um, using that to plan forward. In terms of parents, we really are committed to making sure that nobody misses the information, so we wanted to use back to school night as the opportunity rather than just relying on emails because we know that's a really important time for families and teachers. So uh, we want to be sure all <coughs> fifth grade parents have the information at back to school night. Um, prior to the next board meeting, also we'll make the curricula options available um, before the board meeting starts so that anybody who missed any of those other meetings last year and still wants to take a look at it, we would have that option. Um, we plan to continue surveying parents at the parent information session. We got a lot of really great feedback and uh, thoughts from parents at that event. And we would be putting out, as a follow-up to the Back to School Night information, the electronic link for parents to express their choice. And then, of course, continuing to update our website. And then basically it's kind of following the same flow. We find out their <coughs> preference, we get the teachers matched up, we let the parents know how that went and who their child's teacher would be and when the teaching would occur and then we're going into the um, lessons and, and homework that also is supportive for those parent conversations. So just a quick reminder of what we heard last year and the improvements that we're going for just to reiterate again that we want to maximize and support and honor parent choice in our model. And we talked about lots of these things last year, uh, just keeping all of this going, trying to bring in some additionally, in addition to the courses that we have um, planned here, we are hoping to offer some optional um, parent-child courses, that was one of the pieces of feedback, is that some people might want to opt out of the in-school lessons, um, but they might want to do a course with their child, so like the Stanford heart-to-heart -heart kind of idea, so we've been researching that, planning to finalize that soon, and that could even be, it doesn't have to be just fifth grade, there's lots of different options we're looking at there. And then just knowing that our teachers really need flexibility and support, so in terms of when they're scheduling the lessons in the year, last year it was really crunched. We want to give them flexibility so they're already planning now when would it best fit as a unit of study, giving them choice on when they would attend professional development and also customizing that for this year. And then um, just we continue to es establish our district agreements with the teachers, so this is part of the PD. Last year, you might remember, we talked about like, okay, these are the scenarios that are available, which ones do we agree to use? So it's just firming those up each year with the teachers um, to be sure we're being responsive to um, what they're noticing the kids need. Um, last year also, we were collected information as part of program monitoring, so we're planning to do those same pieces this year with one addition. So you might remember we had the student assessment, the student survey. This is all um, part of the June presentation. We had the teacher survey, the opt-out rate. Teachers did PD feedback for us. Um, because we are moving forward with the choice model, we thought this year we'd also really like to know as part of our measures, did parents feel supported, our fifth grade parents, in making a choice? that was right for their child and their family. So as we go forward with our communication, the process happens, we'll have some parents that choose opt-out or partial, some that choose PPP, some that choose PT at the end of the process just to check in and say, how did that go for you and your family? Did you feel supported? And see how, how we accomplish that goal. Okay, so we're at discussion. 
And I wanted to just uh, put this slide back up just as a reminder that this is one of the things that we wanted to discuss today. And then, of course, anything else that you wanted to bring up. So before discussion, does anybody have any questions for Allison? I have uh, two questions. Uh, so first, I have been contacted by some parents who said they received something from the district as minutes where it came out and, and basically said PP is a default option, PPP is an alternative option. I just wanted to see if that was the case, or is that just one of those things that's floating I think there? possibly some of our schools got started with back to school night before this meeting, so we need to yeah. contain that. And Hold Stephen, that. will you help me remember? Correct. There, I think there yeah. could be even some tonight, so we just want to be sure we're not that letter, we're containing it. <laughs> so um, I think that may be the case, but we, we can correct that. We said that we would follow up that letter with an additional communication with the link, you know, for parents to express the choice so we can think about the wording in that and make sure we're it's not out there still somewhere. I and apologize for that. I know there's a lot of moving pieces. It's amazing what you've done when there's so much detail into this. You know, like you're specifying where every screw goes. So thanks uh, for this. I, the other question, I guess, is around this is, is there room, uh, is there time in the timeline? If so if they don't select an option um, for us to go back and sort of ask them again? Definitely. Like, like I'm getting nagged from the district for not filling in these forms for my kids, and I get one every day. Eventually, after seven or eight, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if yeah. there yeah. would be sort of options for things like that to Definitely. sort of reiterate the importance yeah. of please pick something before we make some kind of choice for them. Absolutely. And I know our, our teachers and our principals, that's always their first go-to is making that personal contact and really trying. So I really think this is not going to be a big issue at all because I know that that connection piece is a strength for our district. So we wouldn't just say, oh, you missed the deadline and we're just assigning you. We would make every attempt to get that information. And they, I, I'm a parent too, I know it's form season, right? It's like, yes. ev <laughs> they're everywhere. And donations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I have a question like on the parent survey part, right? Uh -huh. So I thought that, um, uh, can you go on to that, that slide? Yeah, no, 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 I think the timeline, yeah. yeah. So here uh, in the back to school time, you're pro you're going to request this, right? If so, I read that, uh, so we or around that time frame. Yeah, we wanted to kind of alert them to this as part of fifth grade uh, because fifth grade teachers are going over their kind of course of study for the year. So we didn't want it to be a one-time thing. So kind of let them know, hey, this is coming. You're going to be getting information at back to school night, and then follow up with the okay, now, now it's time for you to express your preference after the parent information sessions, though, because they, they need to have an opportunity to attend the presentation before they make a choice. So the goal or the objective here is to find out how many people are going to take A, B, C out of this, right. or what, they, wh what all kind of questions like will be, what would be the summary of the survey like actually? So it, it would be just for fifth grade parents because we're doing this so that we can make sure we put the children in the courses that their parents want them to be in. So we need the information because we need to figure out, okay, which teachers need to be trained in which one. So it's going to say, okay, fifth grade parents, uh, these are the options. Which one do you choose? PPP, PT, opt out. And you know we'll keep communicating with them about the parent information sessions where they can learn about. Um, the different options. Uh, is it, uh, I'm sorry to be a little bit picky on that. Is it like going to be an S or no or pick one of this or something like that or it, would there be something for them to make the comments also on that? Or did we think about that yet? At least? Um, for that particular thing, we're just looking for which one do they want their child to be in. Um, we can, we, I'm sure we'll put information in there about who to go to if they have questions, which would be their teacher or their principal as a first step. Um, at the parent information meetings, that's one of the places where we do a parent survey and we always collect kind of the open comments and questions as part of that too. Um, is there something you're hoping we're going to ask or what's on your uh, mind? No, I that? was thinking that the next set of actions, uh -huh. right? Like let's say we are in August, September, we are triggering this. And this action from October, November, and down. Yeah. How is it going to impact? Like, are we going, like, let's say, it is he weighing heavily onto one of that. Uh -huh. 
So maybe some percentage, I'm, I'm very sure like when you are giving choice, there will be a distribution. But definitely, uh, at least by hearing the feedback from parents and other things and various forums, you see that uh, definitely at least one of the choices would have more people, right? Or, or much yeah. more also, not just yeah. more. Right. More is like probably <laughs> not the right word. Means if it weighs towards heavily towards one side, uh -huh. okay, whatever it is, uh, how are we going to tackle that? Like in, in terms of your your actions for that, like kind of. Yeah, like logistically, how are we gonna deal with yeah, it yeah. if it's just, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we're going into this prepared to be responsive to whatever the preferences are. So um, we think we can address it with our own staff. We're, we have our training dates reserved with both PPP and PT trainers. We have our coaches um, <coughs> being trained to give us some flex. We have um, our consultants we could pull in if we could not accommodate it with our own staff. We think it will work out. So, I mean, we if we end up with like a, a bigger class that we need to support in some way, you know, put extra, like let's say we need to have a teacher and a coach or a teacher and an aide because it's a larger number, we'll, we can deal with all of those things. We, the priority is making sure that people get whatever they express as their choice. And we think we can do that. I'm gonna respond to your question because <laughs> Um, with regard to asking for comments on the so when they make their choice, I think that's not the right thing to do because I think that their parents are going to have lots of opportunities to comment through a lot of the other um, strategies that Allison has outlined. So I think when it comes down, when the rubber hits the road and it comes down to now it's time to make a choice, that's not a time for comment. That's a time to say, I want this, this, or this. Okay. It's just so my the, opinion. So, so the survey is pretty much what is your choice that's it that last one that she talked about I, my opinion is yeah. that's all it should be okay yeah maybe a little information around it but yeah basically which one do you pick yeah and i think we need to clarify prior to that um uh the, the random pick also lottery because that is i think uh that's probably that that is like an open-ended thing right so i think uh definitely we need to before the I know, I'm, I'm at least I'm, maybe this is a discussion item uh, rather than a question, but I'm just putting, throwing it out because uh, random is again, it's, it's a random. It's a, it's a, what does it mean? So uh, probably, you know, it's coming back to default and random kind of thing, right? The choice between these two will be picked random, like, uh, yeah, this last one. So this is a little bit of uh, alarming. Uh, I'm sure there'll be concerns on this. Well, uh, okay, I, I, I guess, um, before we make something more alarming than it is, um, the, the reality is everyone's gonna be really pushed hard to make a choice. What's your choice? What's your choice? What's your choice? We're gonna get down to, at, at any one school, maybe a kid, maybe two. So we're gonna work with that child and that parent. We're gonna say, what, what should we do here? We're gonna call the family. And if after doing all that, there ends up being somebody who simply would not tell us, we're gonna have to make a decision because the law tells us we have to make a decision. Right, we have to do that. And so what we're suggesting is, why don't we start with, maybe it's best for a child to stay in a, in a case in which a parent simply would not give us an answer, no matter how hard we asked and how much we did, how about we let the child stay with his or her actual teacher, which is actually something that came up through the surveys as something that was of value to the children, right? And then, uh, if, if for some reason that, pardon me. Sorry, there's a security protocol just happened on Google that shut down the cameras, so we're okay. not recording right now. So okay. I just want to oh, call that out. Well, or, or you can <laughs> okay. keep talking. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> right. But I don't know if we want to pause for a second, see if we can fix the protocol, or if we want to continue. I just want to present that. Uh, well, actually, I, I'm hoping we're going to be done in a minute. I, I, I would suggest we, we finish it if it makes sense to do, because we're not voting on anything today. We're going to be o okay in that. If we were voting, I would say yes. But I'm hoping we're going to take... How many people are watching? Yeah. You can't see anything. I, okay. I, 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 I rather. I really strongly rather wait till the video is up. For this particular one. Okay. I, I really would. All I'm right. sorry. Uh, let, yeah, let's take a break if needed. Uh, we can take a break. Call. Let's take a break. I, yeah. Sorry. I'm hoping. I'm hoping to take a break after this because I think it's good to do before we start the advance. But that's okay. We can take two breaks. I, I, I'm just saying for like two minutes. Yeah. Just to give Jeff a chance. Well, to if see it if comes back, probably. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. I think we yeah. should. It, it's I, definitely. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I think this <laughs> it's one a hard needs topic to be thing. available. <laughs> Two breaks. Two, Two breaks. breaks. Yeah. That works. Sorry. That's the restroom while we're doing this. <laughs> 
And I do have a question when she comes back, Phyllis. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have some questions. Uh, well, we'll wait, though, until yes, I, I yeah. the questions. Until <laughs> I just have yeah. to finish that thought. So that you said this one's, you think, dark chocolate? Is it black? Is yeah, it black chocolate? chocolate. That's dark chocolate. Yeah. That's not going to work? Mm-hmm. Really dark chocolate. Uh, which one did you get? Oh, mint peach? Yes. Yeah, yeah crazy, it? right? <laughs> like, you wouldn't think to put those two flavors together. Which one? Mint peach. Mint? And peach? Yeah. Is it good? Oh, yeah, it's a super, like, you wouldn't think that it would be good. But. What else are we going to talk about right now? So my friends who come back to Europe occasionally, somebody will bring me back. Um, I'm not a big candy person, but Haribo gummy bears in Europe, there is a banana flavor that comes in like the the, the mix pack. Oh, my God. (laughs) So Haribo from Europe is real sugar. Yeah. It's not. Is that what it is? It's not high fructose. Well, here it's like pineapple or something, which is fine. Like I'm not a big you know, that's not my vice, but, um, oh, but the banana gummy bears, oh. <laughs> I've never had the banana disgusting. one, but my sister-in-law lives in London. Difficulties, so we had to take a short break, and now we should be back up um, video and audio both. So continuing with the discussion on human growth and development. I don't, uh, so I, I was mid-sentence, <laughs> but I, I think you, you get the point that given that the law is that we have to do something, we can't not do something, um, we have to provide the curriculum in that rare occasion where a child has not selected, but a, a parent or a parent has not selected, but we are required to provide it. If we're not going to want to give more weight to one or the other at that point, we have to do something. That's just, that's just a reality. So we're trying to come up with something that makes sense. For us, the random just may, you know, for me, it's partially random to say, well, what if in, in this school 35 uh, uh, kids are taking uh, PPP and only 15 in the other, in that case of that kid, why not put them in the smaller class? That would be a value. Or why not put them in the class with your own teacher because that would be better for the child. So I'm just trying to come up, what do we do without trying to say the default will be this one because then we're defeating our purpose of remaining open and not trying to promote any one versus another. And, and the law, we can't get around the law. The law says we have to do something. We can't not provide a curriculum. And if we have adopted two curricula, we have to make a decision. That's just the way it is. Can we consider that as an opt-out then? No. No, no actually, that's, no. What, that's what's clear. They say you may not exclude a child from it if they have not selected something. That's, that's just the law. And so we, we have to work within that. So rather than I think I, I would suggest you, yeah, it's, it's a suggestion again, we can discuss this, but I would rather, I would remind them, keep reminding to ch- choose one of this rather than we, yes. fo- we randomly picking. Right, the yes. nine emails that Jerry gets <laughs> before he fills out his forms. <laughs> yeah. Can I just point out to everybody, it is really, really common that when we need children and their families to sign off and say what they want, field trips, um, events. Uh, there are so many things they do where they make sure 100% of those things come back. So this isn't some weird thing that we're doing. We do it all the time. 
they will manage that. They understand that we don't want to have to make a decision for someone. The whole point is it's about parent choice, right? So I don't want you feeling like this is so oddly different of, of how are we gonna get 100% of the kids. I actually think that we're almost gonna be at 100%. I would bet across the entire district, we might have two or three kids that we have to place this way. So I, I, I question how critical it is for us to spend a lot of time on this because I, I trust our staff to be able to manage that the right way. Yeah, I, only my concern there was that random word because that can, you know, I understand that what you're saying, it could be a very small percentage of people could be in that category, but, uh, um, you know, or we should say that if you are not responding, we'll have to put random, something like that, like because random could should not be an option, rather. I would say. If I could add, I know what, what I understand, I, my take of Satish's point is uh, some people wonder, you know, how random is random, and, and I wonder, certainly we're gonna collect statistics on this, would it be within the law to be able to, because there's, I think, a lot of interest in this at the different school sites, what percentage of the kids have this, what percentage of the kids have that not individual, but an aggregate level, will we be able to publish that or share that with the community? At school X, you know, 40% here, 50 or 60, I guess. Uh, I selected this versus that, you mean? Yes, that's right, to say, at a, because I, I can imagine people wondering, well, you guys go, go to the back room and it's random, and you know, I, I think that's what I took this So why don't I, 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 I that, I think there's confusion about this. That's not what we're talking about. So what I recommend is we take that out and we just say, we'll put them in the class with uh, uh, their own teacher. Um, and if for any reason that's not gonna work, then we would put them in the class that has fewer and just call it a day, right? Because that, that, and uh, I, I'm just gonna say, by the way, that's random. That's, a, you know, it's a certain kind of randomness. So um, we, can we can debate what that actually means. But if by using the word random at the bottom there actually causes that problem, because the 4060 actually doesn't answer the question, because 4060 might actually have equally divided classrooms at that moment, right, depending on how, how you're doing it. So um, I, 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 I just think we're overcomplicating it. The, con the conversation is what is going to matter, and the teacher's really pushing for I want to know what each one of my children's parents are selecting for them so we're not teaching something that people don't want their child to be taught. Um, well, I understand that or we can think it's an overcomplicated thing, but um, the reason behind that is it is becoming extremely sensitive, okay? So let's be clear what you're offering. Let's be clear on our wordings, okay? We do not want to have any ambiguity here and there on that. That's why, otherwise if it's a standard, any other things, this probably wouldn't have been a big issue, okay? I think we do not want to have any doubt there around on that. And it's a perfect choice of parent, and they go with that, and we support that kind of. I wanna just clarify something, because we kind of talked about like pushing the parents to choose one or the other. I, I wanna make sure there's an option for no preference, or I would like to have that, right? Yes. Like. No, that's on there. Oh, the, so it'd be like, oh, you know. Oh, that they say no oh, like four yeah, choices? Like choice A, like whatever, sure PPP. Right. I'd like, I would like my child to attend PPP. I would like my child to attend PT. I have no preference. Please place. As teacher. Yeah, yeah, with my, you know. Or, and sort of and then, friendly add-on to that, what I hear from is people who say, I want to be with my kid's teacher, right? right? Okay. So I, I think if, if we're not going to decide which teachers are teaching which until we know the numbers, I mm -hmm. think we need to allow some room for people who would really prefer that their child's just with their child's teacher. Yeah, we talked about that as a possibility. Yeah. Just saying that they could select regardless of which curricula. Yeah. Um, right. I, I want my child with my, uh, his or her teacher, classroom teacher, classroom yeah. teacher right? Yeah. We talked about that as an and I think no preference is good because that gives you some flexibility in how to balance the numbers. I'm not comfortable. Or you much of anything. Why I'm cutting there is I think Go it's ahead. good. Otherwise, we'll lose the momentum yeah. there. Uh, so no preference is probably, I think, it coming back to a randomness again, right? No preference, what you do? So you have to, you have to if you are giving choices, you have to fall in one of the buckets. Okay, otherwise somebody else is making a decision for, on your behalf when I say no preference. Uh, okay, so you are or out of the above or whatever it is, that's what you're giving practically. And then this random pick or all those things come in picture. Some, because they have to be in one of the bucket if you are giving choices. Okay, at least opt out bucket. So no preferences, uh, 
I don't know it's going to fly much. Uh, then it will be you're making somebody else to make a decision on your behalf. But what, 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 what is, why is that seen as not a parent choice? If the parent chooses, I actually, because what if a parent does feel, and by the way, I actually think the majority of parents feel this way, from what I understand, is I'm okay with either. Do make a choice for me, and I would prefer that because you're the experts. You didn't ask me what I want to teach for a reading. You didn't ask me what to write, but this is a sensitive issue, so we are going to work really, really hard to get parents to decide, but why is it actually not a parent choice when they choose, I want you to, to make a decision? Yeah, then that, that's where the default come in picture then, right? So when, when no, earlier when we talked about default, no preference will go to the default, kind of. No, no default, good. But then no choice or no preference, then that will be a problem. It will be just hanging. So but we would do this. We, 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 we would say, um, okay, then we're, our number one thing is we're going to try to put them with their, their teacher, their classroom teacher. And if that doesn't work out, we're going to put them in the one where maybe if, it, if it's really unbalanced, we would do that. But what we're trying to do is stay away from preferencing it. That's what we're, we don't want to say the default is or here's the preference or, uh, but, but I, I just don't know how to make a parent, a true parent choice in which you still have to teach the curriculum by law, unfortunately, to the kids who did not declare what they want. If you believe in choice, you believe in choice. So I'm not certain, so I'm, well, we believe in choice, but if you don't do this and you don't have, you know what I'm saying, that, that just, it, that to me, it's contrary to the point. Now, I want to be clear. I think we should really push and try to get to every single parent does say, this is the one I choose. So I don't want to make it into, oh, we're going to have a whole bunch of people who don't choose. But I, I, I don't know. I, again, I just feel like we overthink it a little bit, and I think we're going to be able to solve this with the idea of always be true to his parent choice. That's what we're doing. We're no preference is as good as no choice, right? They are not choosing. That's bad. So, but so let's, I just, what if we had five parents in the district that did not return anything? Okay. What would you do? If you were in charge, what would you do? Uh, there could be many reasons why they're not I want to know right? what you what you would do. What would you do with those I, I five do a, children? I do a follow-up, and they, we, we ask them to make right. them to a, to a choice, right. rather than we choosing for them. But right. what if they don't? That's what we're going to do. So I, to be clear, that's what we're going to do. So what if in the end, because what the law says is if in the end they simply don't declare, you are obligated as a district to provide the curriculum. And since we have two, what do we do? So to to Phyllis's point, what do we do in that very rare occasion with the very few kids we're talking about in this entire district, what are we going to do? We have to have some solution. And I'm just saying, don't go to a default because that is preferencing and it's getting back to what people are really complaining about. Why are we preferencing one over the other? Let's not go there. And I'm just saying there are solutions. And we're, we're putting the top two. We can get rid of the bottom and say, don't don't use the term random. Yeah, yeah. Uh, stay away from that. But we have to have a solution, and the so and because the law does not permit us otherwise. So this is going to come back to us in at on the twenty sixth, and you'll be here that night, right? So I want you to think about if you have a better solution that you bring it back to us at that time, because well, I don't think anybody or send it to, send it to Kim, yeah, because I don't think any of us have a better solution. No, okay, but I would like to. Is it okay to discuss or yeah. we are cutting yes. down? No, no. no. Do we have are then I would like to hear from others also on this. I actually, I still had questions. Me too. I, I thought we were still yeah, let's, 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 let's Okay. Yeah. And, and then we'll come back to the discussion. All right, and then, and then we'll come back to this. Lori had one, too. She, was, she had your hand up? Well, but yeah, so my, my main question was, so I've, I've heard from parents who would prefer PPP. I've heard from parents who would prefer PT. I've heard from parents who say, I just want my kiddo with my child's teacher. So where in the timeline can we make allowances for that? And it sounds like you think you can bring that back as a, as a choice that they'd make initially, if I understood that correctly. That they could make that choice. Like one, yeah. of, one of their choices could be, their choice. I have a preference with one or the other curriculum, and another choice could be wherever my teacher winds up teaching is where I'd like my child to right. stay. I, I think yes? I'm pretty sure we can do that, right? But I don't, I don't oh. think we had mm -hmm. a problem with that, yeah. Can you explore that? Yeah, Okay, absolutely. thank you. Okay. So I'm going over to Sylvia. You had a question. Well, not to me because okay, I, I Jerry. lost it in the so, discussion. Sure. Uh, so we've had you know, folks contact us and ask me about the cost of offering two curriculums rather than one. So I wanted to address that. I was wondering, Allison, if you could address that publicly by going with this option of offering two, what are the additional costs we're incurring over if we had just selected one? 
So I'd have to look back to get the exact figures. I mean, in any case, we would be training the teachers. There are slight differences between each of the organizations that provide the training in terms of the parent nights and the teacher training. So, you know, there's a little bit of difference because of that. But in terms of kind of the overall, we still would be um, offering training for the teachers. We would need to um, offer more parent information sessions because we want to offer options for parents to learn about the curriculum, which we would be able to condense if we just had you know, one curriculum, but it's not a significant difference. Um, if we get into a situation where something unexpected happens, I, don't, I think this is unlikely, but if we need to pull in the, the consultants to help us manage the logistics, there could be some additional costs, but I, I don't really foresee there being any significant difference. It's, it's more uh, the complication of the logistics and managing the procedures, which it with, is within the scope of our responsibility in Ed Services, making sure that we're supporting the sites and knowing how to communicate and getting the form set up and all of that, but it's really not an additional cost. So it sounds like the burden is really more on the staff, right? because we only have so many students and so rather than buying 100 apples, we're buying 50 apples and 50 bananas. So from that standpoint, the cost of the instructional material shouldn't matter significantly is what I'm hearing. It's I, really the mm -hmm. arranging for two sets of information sessions and um, I, I guess just more staff time in running those and then staff time in making the arrangements. But yeah. in terms of the check we write to um, Health Connected or whoever's running, that shouldn't be too big a difference? Right, I mean, there. when we presented last year, we went over the, you know, there are some differences in the cost of the curriculum, and so, you know, there's a little bit of difference there between the two agencies, and, you know, of course, we bought lots of those teacher binders last year because of piloting, so, you know, I don't really foresee it being significantly more in cost. In time, yes, you know, the, the just working through the logistics, but we can do that, and we're we're already technically because it. It, it actually was fourteen thousand. So it's year it says estimated it. total in year one was fourteen thousand four twenty nine. So what would be the less would, that was the estimated total for all of it for oh, okay. doing both. Yeah, I, I so just wanted to point out that, if, if right? we went with the more expensive one, but since we don't know, so hypothetically it could be that this is cheaper because if we have we selected the more expensive one, then we actually would have been spending more. And so and the number is so low that I just don't think that's a determinant. And I would just say if we're investing more because of engaging with the parents, mm -hmm. that's worth it. So yeah. that's fine, yeah. right? All right, thank you. Yeah, and uh, one of the differences that came up last year was in the teacher training. So PPP had the two-day training and PT had the one-day training, but I've been working with the consultants because we're in the second year of training, we're just it's gonna be one day for both, you know, so that'll be a savings from the ori original plan. Can I ask a clarifying question about training? They just get trained, so like the, the teachers who trained this past year they don't have to get trained again, do they? Or they do, okay. and this is not related to our plan, really. Um, we did that for seventh grade as well, two years of training, and it's pretty typical when we have something new to not just do the one-time training. And um, the reason is once the teachers start using it, then new questions come up. So we'll work with <coughs> the teachers on what will make sense. We probably have a mix of people who are new to that curriculum and who attended the training last year, but there's a lot of overlap as well. And part of the training in both programs is about setting the tone and developing a respectful environment. So I know we can work it out and we expected, even if we were all using the same, we would have had a second year of training to be sure that they were prepared to you know, address the questions that come up and set that tone in the classroom and that's standard, so. Mm -hmm. Can I go back to the, the the choices, the form? I don't want to like be the dead <coughs> horse, but like I I I would I think my picture of what it would look like would be I choose PT, I choose PPP, I have no preference. I'd like to opt out, right? And then below that, there'd be some sort of verbiage about if you ch if you have no preference, we will make every effort to keep your child with their teacher but I wouldn't want to do the, I have no preference, please keep my child with the teacher because then it somehow, it assigns a value to that decision. You know what I mean? Like, so I, like, and plus we don't know for sure if, if they'll be kept with their teacher because let's say whatever, like 35 students pick that curriculum and that teacher is already committed to that curriculum. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. 
So that, that would be my comment on, on how the form should look. Yeah, I, think I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I, I think one of the things I am nervous about is that we're backing ourselves into a situation where we are inadvertently continuing to, because logistically how, how we're laying it out, it's pushing people to believe a certain thing in a certain way. And to some degree, I like having less on there and then leave it to the, the schools to honor and make sure every, every parent does choose. We work with them to figure out what's the right thing. We can talk to them about how we would place them. And, and if that parents, please tell us, you, oh, you want to put your kid there? But as soon as you, like you say, as soon as you put it on there, you're, 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 you're sort of another new value add. And, and that becomes the thing that everybody wants to do. And that changes. All of a sudden, now everybody wants to be in their own class. But you can't because one of the teachers has to be teaching the other curriculum, whichever one that is. So I, 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 I would say that, first of all, we, we're not sending that particular choice thing out for a while, right? When do we do that? The letter that actually says, we need you to pick. We're hoping to do it in early fall so we would know sometime in October what the parent preferences okay. are because it just takes a while to get everything organized. But it's, it's flexible. We don't want to send it out before we're ready. <laughs> so. I I, I, I'm very uncomfortable with forcing parents to choose because as a parent, I would be stressed out by that decision. And like if I'm you know, a busy Silicon Valley engineer and all the other educational decisions generally are left to the school and all of a sudden I'm being forced right. to choose and then all of a sudden it feels like a big decision. And, and certainly it is a big decision for, you know, but, but at the same time, maybe that's, you're just not, as a parent, that's not something that that's that important to you, right? Or, right. You know, or we wouldn't be offering both curricula if they weren't both absolutely right. meeting all of and the requirements yeah. and doing well by kids. Yes. Right. So right, So you like the idea of having a, I, 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 I prefer like, not to choose. Or yeah, whatever, like yeah. I have no preference. Put my child wherever, Where you want. Yeah, wherever yeah. you want, right? Because because if, if I have to choose, now I feel stressed out. Yeah. Like now I have to do research. Now I have to like make a decision because one is obviously better than the other because, you know what I mean? Like, so it just makes me, I don't know, it's, it's forcing me to do something that I, like. What do others think on that? I think you, you see it's the opposite, I think. Yeah, I'm the only person who looks like art here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that's true, yeah, right? but I th yeah, but I, th I think still, I'm stressing, my, I am not going to repeat everything, but I think you have more ambiguity, more, more, you know, in the air, up in the air kind of things. Oh, then later changing and all those things. You are giving more opportunities then. I think make it very clear, one of these buckets. Then, and as they said, that maybe five people are having, we can deal with that. That's much better, I think. You are having 50 people in that choice, you will have more the randomness coming in picture. I don't think you're going to have 50, but yeah. No, I no think choice. It's be no very choice, small. kind of. Yeah. No choice could be many. Well, you don't know. I, I think, I think what Sophie point. is raising is that yeah. that maybe. Um, I mean, what I'm hearing that's similar about what the two of you are saying is that by leaving it, by leaving it open, you're ending up having more people saying, "Well, you decide for me, right?" Um, and which uh, so so I get that, but that's why I like the idea of saying, "Let's really work with people." And 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 I agree, we should say, "If you really don't have a choice, that's okay. We'll figure it out." Um, and then we work with you, and that's that's how we make a decision on it. But I, I get this this difference here. But ultimately, I want to I want to suggest that what is the most intellectually consistent with the notion of, of choice. And and that's what I'm trying. And I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think it is. If somebody wants to say, you know, I, I'd prefer you decide for me, I think they should get to do that. Because that's a choice that a parent makes, right? Otherwise, you're forcing them to do something. As you're saying, that I don't want to have to make that decision, right? So I, I'm trying to think, which is that one thing that does not show in any way, oh, we think this is a better curricula, curriculum than the other, and honors choice. That's what I'm trying to get us to here. And I, I, my gut is allowing somebody, like you, for you, you would feel I had a choice by saying, I don't want to I, I have to pick, and I'm fine with either one. I'm, I'm truly fine with either one. For me, the only 
question that really raises is I think it goes back to our timeline of, of what we're offering to parents to help them make that choice, right? I mean, we're offering our, our, our training sessions again. We're offering an FAQ, an, opportuni an FAQ. We're offering an opportunity for appointments to come right. in and, and curriculum review. Right. Uh, I imagine you're still going to get some questions at the sites from parents who might have more um, more or different questions than maybe what's addressed in either the public forums or in the uh, FAQ. So, you know, like my, my concern just from a logistics standpoint would just be, um, I, I guess as, as consistent as we can across sites, I, it would make me more comfortable if there was the same information available everywhere. Um, and, and also that, um, you know, especially in this first year that we're just really ready to <laughs> support both our teachers and our principals in, um, in, in those questions that, that are, that, that that we give them permission to come back to us and say, you know, like we're struggling with this particular family because, you know, they have a question that maybe our materials aren't covering or, or whatever. So uh, as long as I think we have those things in place to support our sites and support um, our families and helping them to make that decision, if they need more information versus, to Sylvia's point, if, if they just want to say, I'm, I'm okay, I think I, I'm with you. I think that's a choice. I think that's a parent's prerogative to say. I trust that the school board wouldn't have approved both if they weren't both of, of value and merit and, and, and a good thing for kids. So, um. so into, is, sure. it, is it in the, you are suggesting to, this is as part of the survey or part of the implementation, which one you are saying? So we are, I, I understand that two process going to happen. One is a survey where you are asking them to put the choice. Then there'll be a, eventually some October or November or sometime you are going to do a real enrollment or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. I guess so. This is for for us to know what uh, what would be the ratio or what is that parents choose, right? And fine tune your actions based right. on that, right? Uh -huh. So where is it going to go, your question? So from my, my point of view is it's implementation. Uh, it's, not, it's uh, not, not during it's the- It's not like just kind of survey to see where everybody is. It's more, it's actual, no, this question would go as part of the survey, that choice, like four choices. Yeah. Uh, currently, we have, we have three choices, whatever you're talking. Right. Okay, the four choice, what you're suggesting would be part of the survey question? Yes. That that would be my, That that's what I'm proposing. Okay. I, I'm, so, my son's, tr we're trying to decide in our family right now between SAT and ACT, <laughs> and it is the most stressful thing, because... <laughs> They're supposed yeah. to be the same. They just, they're kind of similar tests. Like, and both college, the colleges supposedly take both tests, but it is, I have done so much <laughs> research, reading articles, reading, going on like parent blogs, and it is, it is Too so much. stressful, yeah. right? Because yeah. I'm like, what if I make the wrong choice? Like, what if somehow this impacts, you know? And, and I can have some perspective and say, okay, they're, you know, it's probably going to be okay whichever one we end up choosing, but but it's I, it, in the moment. I I'd rather somebody just make the decision <laughs> for me. Like like, no. like like okay, yep, yeah, our school just yeah. does SAT or our school just does ACT. Right. Yeah. Then then like then so I think is. that's what I'm thinking right. about, like yeah. in that sense. So. But because we don't want to take away choice, then a choice is I have no choice. Yeah, or I yeah. just not that I don't have any choice, but. I'm okay with either. I'm okay with either. Right. Is it okay if Wait. I yeah. jump in on that? Yeah. Just as a reminder, I think one of our best opportunities is we get a chance to have that face time with the parents before we're asking them to make that choice. And so even last year, there was a different kind of choice, and we really worked hard to set up those parent meetings. I know a lot of you were there. Um, at the beginning of the meeting to say, okay, parents, just take a breath. You're in the driver's seat. You are going to make a choice, and we want to give you everything you need to do so. And you know, we really tried to help people feel comfortable in those meetings with knowing that they had the opt-out. In this case, we have a chance to set up the story for them um, in those meetings, too. A lot of parents attend. We could make a big push for people to attend. We could tell the story about 
commitment to community engagement, the work of the task force, how we landed at this spot, so people would have that context as well. Um, I think some people you know, will want to know more about what the task force work was about, and you know, we can answer those questions and give them all the information they need, make sure they know when the different events are, and, and having that face time is really when we work through those things. So it's not just that we're just gonna be sending the form and saying, pick one will do the communication around come to the event, um, talk to your teachers, talk to your principal. Okay, anything else on this topic? Um, I'll, I'll just throw in my two cents here. I, it's, I love working with you guys. All these different, <laughs> <laughs> thoughtful, I, it's, no seriously, this is, I really value that we have the five of us here throwing out these different ideas. Um, you know, th this kind of, it, it makes me feel like I've gone back to college in algorithm design class. <laughs> um, and because I started thinking about all the corner cases. What if, what if you, you allow people to pick that they want to be with a classroom teacher and the whole class picks that? Now what do you do? Now you're stuck, right? Every, and so anyway, um, I think, I think um, people can always not make a choice by just refusing to answer our question, whether or not we put a box on there for them to check. They can always do that by just like not turning things in. And so therefore, um, whether we put the box on there um, to not have a choice, we have to handle that in our algorithm because um, they, that can always happen, right? Whether, and we can talk about whether or not you should have the box. You basically have two classes of algorithms up there. You have deterministic ones and indeterministic ones, right? The first two up there, um, I can, I can follow a set of rules given, and, and I know what I'm gonna end up with. That third one, it's flipping a coin. Um, there plus, that one is not deterministic. You really won't know until you flip a coin if you're doing a random lottery. I would just say, you know, given the amount of communication we've had with this, I have no doubt between now and September 26, people will be writing in with perhaps different algorithms. I, I could honestly live with any of these, I think, um, I, I would like to ask that we teach statistics on this because one of the things that we've heard throughout this is I think everybody writes in and uh, they have all the different opinions, but I think I think everybody feels they represent the majority and, 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 and that's very common. I mean, I think we're all this way. And I think having actual, we run this for a couple of years, we actually collect data on what the community chooses that would be so helpful for the future. So I don't have a strong preference, I, I love hearing about this interaction, I, I'm, I'm just thinking from an algorithm design standpoint, you have to handle that case. And therefore, I don't care as much whether or not the box is there, just because we, we have to think that through. So that's how I'm looking at it. You have basically two classes, and yeah, well, I'm, I'd love to hear what the community, I'm sure someone will write in with something. Oh. <laughs> Great. I answered 60 emails or 70 <laughs> these last two days, so yeah, we're hearing a lot. Um, I could see how uh, you know, that is that been hard on me after <laughs> we <laughs> read it. <laughs> and Sylvia is asking this back. <laughs> okay, anything That's else on human growth before we move on? At least we're laughing. This is good. So we're um, bringing it so back on the 26th. We are. And I, I would encourage all of you and community, if you have ideas, send them to me because we will keep kicking these around so that we feel prepared on the 26th to make a decision because we really do need to move move past this point that we're at and make a decision. So if you have more ideas, please send them to me. Yeah. I like this subject so much I'm not letting you to go. Last question. Uh, so okay. uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, really the last question. <laughs> yeah, so uh, <laughs> have you decided what would be the, the survey? Because 26 may be a month from now or whatever. So uh, I, th I think all this or uh, back to school, everything will be done by then. So, right, so you have to, this survey has to go before that. Um, so, okay. do you, do, have you decided what would be the content? Or? So, so I'm thinking we're gonna do two separate things. One is the make a choice link, and then the survey at the parent education event. So, which one are you asking about? The choice? The, choi the, the, the choice, choice what parents prefer, right? That's right. what I thought that we are yeah. splitting two. Into the prefer preference thing. So in that only simple three or four or whatever yeah. we when decide we on. Gonna, yes, so okay. you're asking what would it say? Yeah, no, uh, we are not, I don't think we had a conclusion on that, that the fourth is needed or not, I guess. So by 26, it'll be too late, um, right? So I guess so. Oh, so you're suggesting that the board approve that? So what should be at least the, uh, 
the parent survey. I'm not telling how right. you implement right. it. What are the choices going to be? In the survey, right. yeah, we'll have to do that. We do not want to have one more survey again. Right? So can we bring that back to us on the 12th? Is it too late again? Do we really have to do it before the 26th? Um, if we don't start collecting that information until October, we can do whatever, whatever yeah. we need to so do. Maybe, we'll push um, everything out. But. Maybe we could find a way to do a, uh, I, I think we all agree we want them to say, I definitely want PPP, I definitely want uh, PT. Mm -hmm. um, opt out. Yeah, I, I definitely want to opt out. Yeah, yeah. And, and we could do a follow up and maybe we say, we couldn't maybe even put on there something like, for those of you who are undecided, um, you know, that ha has some strategy for talking with them, doing something, put it on there, uh, and then we can follow up at, uh, with a, a, a survey if we want to add a question or whatever. I mean, because they, they can say, like you can say, I don't know at this time, at least that would give us information, right? I, I, I or something like that so to meet your need to say I prefer not to deal with it. I know you don't I know you don't I know you want to move on but I could Oh, uh, we got this is something we have to get done, you know. It's <laughs> like I I more want to put this to rest and move on than I want to move on from this right now. Yeah, I want to hear from you. If you've no, got more thoughts, yeah. please take the time to do it. I, this is important. Okay, so, so one thing, I want to clarify terms, right? So I think we're calling it a survey, but it's actually just a form, right? Back so, because survey implies, like, analysis, analysis and, right, and yeah. feedback and, right. like, this is my thoughts on whatever, right? So can, so let's just call it the the form Reference. that they have to fill out, right? Choice, parent choice form. Yeah. And the choice form. And I, and to Jerry's point, I I part of the reason why I want that as a, as a choice is I want to be able to look at statistics on that. Like, because I, I feel like those statistics, those statistics could be used as ammunition one way or the other later on, and I'd love to get, like, because then we would get people saying, see, 60% chose this, and so obviously this is the better choice, and at some point the district's going to make a decision to pick one, and they should pick this one, right? Like, whatever that one is. So I guess I'd like to have the, that choice of I have no preference because I'd like a true, not true, but a, a, at least some reflection of, okay, maybe, because we've all heard emails from both, from parents who want either curriculum, right, one or the other, but, but my suspicion is that there's a large majority of parents that really don't have a preference, and so I guess I'd like to be able to capture that somehow, and I don't know if that's... I, I, okay, and I, I hear what you're saying, but since we aren't presupposing what that would mean anyway, what would we do with that information? Um, I think it's best not to mix them. To your point, it's not a survey, because what you're saying ends up being a survey that we're going to analyze and use for some purpose, and I, I would say, in my mind, from this point forward, until like something else is brought forward, we're going to honor choice. And that means that it doesn't matter if there's only 12 kids in the entire district that choose one particular one, we're gonna do that, right? And that's what we're trying to find out with the form. And so let's not conflate, uh, to your point, you know, it's not a survey, it's a form that says, where are you on your preference as choice? Because this is about choice. We, wa we wanna honor that you get to select for your child the same. We're, we're gonna go through the hard task of figuring out how, now how do we pull that off? And we will pull it off, we will be able to do it, but I'm not thinking, and then someday it's gonna be something else. I'm, so, you know, I'm, I'm assuming what we're putting a stake in the ground on is very specifically choice, not which one's gonna be better, who's gonna pick more, what's gonna, that's the whole, I think that's the whole problem we have. We're so mired in this thing of what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, what's evil. I mean, it's like, that's not the point. We know they're both good. The state has adopted both of them, said you can't adopt them. They, we know they're good. Our task force even said, you know, they are, even though they came up with a certain solution, but that's, that's irrelevant. We're saying, forget all that for a second. We believe in choice. That's what we said, so let's live by it. And that's what I'm saying. I just want to be intellectually honest to that point. How are we, how are we going to stay true and not think about, oh, in the future we're gonna get rid of, that's, that's a suspicion thing that I get sometimes in this community, people have, I get it, but that's not where we're coming from, and so let's prove to everybody we believe in choice, and everything we do is gonna be based on that. That's, 
if I can just push for that a little bit. I, I think I'm 100% with you on that. And the other thing I would say is, I mean, any point in time is just that. It's a point in time, right? Just sure. as my fifth grade class might show one thing and the data doesn't mean next year's fifth grade class won't show something different. Right. And it's right. And that's part of the problem with our curriculum that it only lasts for a few days, an hour during yes. those few days for only one grade level across an entire district, right? So it's, it's like we're... It's like we're doing this huge statistical analysis, but it's it's like it's actually very it's such a small end that we're talking about here that makes it tough. Yeah. Could so I, I mean, I, I I think, and I know you don't totally agree with it, but it might be best for us to include the um, uh, at the, I, I I don't have a preference at this time, right? And just allow people to say that, and that gives the that tells the school you got to work on that one call them and make sure that can I help you decide or are you literally saying you just want us to choose because we can do that that's okay right and we're we'll be you know we're not going to push we don't have a favorite because I really want to make sure people honor that we're not gonna choose because we have a favorite that's not what we're gonna do but we might choose you know we're gonna think well what might be best for this particular child and so we'll we'll figure it out we're happy to do that for you you know so it, it does trigger a conversation or something that would be good to get but I think it's just simply that you know I, I, I at this time I'm not um, I don't have a preference. Add that to the other three. Yes, and thank you, Stephen and Stacy, for letting me know that our last parent information session is scheduled for, I think it's the 19th of September, so if you wanted us to bring a draft of the form on the 26th, we could do that before sending it out. I think, I think that would be a capital plan. Okay, any other comments, questions? All right, we're going to, I'm not going to... No. no. <laughs> Craig was actually, you know, he was looking at me whether I'm. <laughs> so I made sure that I. Oh, good. That. All right. So the next you, item on the agenda is the advance, and we want to take a break about ten minutes. Is that good, Craig? Yeah. And will you take a few minutes during that ten minutes to look over the. Um, the protocol. The and protocols agreements? to see, and I know this board is not passionate about anything. But if there is something on that list <laughs> that you're passionate about, put a little check mark by it so that we can discuss, um, make sure that we hit the things that we're, we're all passionate about. It hasn't about. changed since we reviewed it before the it, meeting, uh, right? Has uh, it? Uh, uh, Renee made the actual changes in green line, or red line, green line, uh, on there so you can see how we changed it based from the on last, our last conversation. From the last meeting. So we but it hasn't changed since I read it this weekend. No. Okay. Oh, Thank no. You. If okay. you've already read it, yeah. yeah okay. So, fine. but if you haven't read it, so go over it. Thank you. Yes, okay. I've got my one note. Okay, yes. so Thank you. we're back when the big hand gets on five. Okay, so we're reconvening at 11.26, and we're going to uh, begin our discussion of the, um, the uh, advance items, and we're going to go until around 12 or 12.15, whenever Craig feels it's a break is appropriate. We'll grab lunch, which is ready for us to go get at that time, and then come back and have a working lunch and hopefully be done between 1.30 and 2. Is that what you're thinking? 1.30. 1.30. Let's shoot for So we're way, we're way behind, so we're going to try to get through the protocols. We've discussed these before um, fairly quickly, and so we can take care of all the advanced items. So I'm going to turn it over to Craig. Yeah, so if I ask that we not necessarily go, you know, uh, item by item, word for word, maybe we could just focus on a few, uh, and anything that came up that you feel we should really discuss. Please, no wordsmithing, send those to me. I can change that later. But um, if there's something in terms of content, did we capture correctly um, what we think uh, was the feedback from last time? And then one item I definitely w need to talk about is the uh, board minutes because this is something that for um, uh, for me and Renee as well as uh, Jerry as the person who uh, as clerk reads them as well we, we just have to get some clarity on what we're doing with board minutes but other than that I think it's whatever you think we need to address so are, uh, with that said are there any let's talk about the ones that are here changes were there any uh, concerns or thoughts on it are we good with that is there anything we need to remind ourselves of I guess I would say too like that maybe we feel yeah we said we would do this but we're not doing that so well so if there's anything like that that you saw too let's talk about that go ahead Lori um, so I have two that um, were highlighted for me so one I've already had one of the union um, 
presidents ask me when we're going to start up the quarterlies. So um, as long as everybody's okay with Phyllis and I continuing that, um, we can schedule that. Oh, sorry. And one that's of the union on presidents has already asked me oh, right. when we're going to start up the quarterly they for this year. They so. had requested October. They wanted to get school started. So I was thinking early that's October. That's right. Kai did. Okay. So yeah. okay. So, but is everybody okay with us continuing to to do those and start that up? So we'll get a date scheduled. So I'll schedule for October, and okay. then the the winter one, presumably you and Jerry will do, depending on how that okay. falls out. And then my other one was. Um, I'm totally fine with the change continuing <coughs> with the um, board president working directly with Dr. Baker to set the agenda, but I'm finding this year, it, I feel like it would be helpful, and I don't even know if this is possible, so I guess it's more of a question. If, when you guys are doing that, is it possible just to send us whatever your working draft is, just to know sort of what major topics are coming? Because I find if I'm waiting till the Friday before, sometimes well, uh, my if we're doing that's why we do the year at a glance, yet. and you all have access to that. So if there's a glitch with uh, you having access to that, we can fix that. Yeah, I, I I look at that, and I'm feeling like that's not getting me there. Well, every, every the way we make the agenda is it's on there, and that's how we make the agenda. So I guess I would need, maybe we could talk offline about how we make it uh, without creating a lot more work, et yeah, cetera, yeah. but that we we make it work because uh, it, I'm just saying it could be that we're not, there's something about it that we're not handling right or something, but okay. it's, a, you know, anything that you see that comes to the board or that will be coming, when we know, by the time we know and when we decide what meeting we're going to do it, we put it on year at a glance, that's, and that's how it makes its way to board docs. <coughs> saying if it's not working maybe work with me and let's see if I, we can come up with a better way to make that work because our intent is that you all would know what are the major items that are coming and when they might be coming so maybe there's just a better way to do it um, and I assume everybody would like to be able to look up somehow what what we already know will be on the agenda at some point okay I've got a question on page two of this on the section on responses to media uh, public in general oh. um, so there's a change here. I just want to make sure I understand the intent of the change um, it uh, so before it said um, we respond to emails sent to us and will copy the superintendent but not other board members and so now the change I think changes had to say cop right right there so I just want to make sure it's the intent then we could copy other board members and then CC the superintendent is optional that's the, I just want to make sure I'm reading that, that green part correctly. Um. Right, and this, my recollection is we uh, asked legal counsel, because I had thought it was better to BCC, so there's no sense of everyone, but they actually said it's the opposite, that if you do it, you, you keep the factual and you, you can CC everyone. Isn't that, so isn't that what we learned? Yeah. The, so there's not limits in terms of Brown Act. I could CC everybody on the board. Content right, as long as there's no back and forth, right? So what, what the Brown Act it would say is you can't deliberate, um, and then you shouldn't write back to someone with anything. But if it's, it, it's just a uh, CC, no discussion, don't respond, you're, you're not allowed to do that. Now that, gets pro now that does get problematic when all of a sudden each one of you wants to do that to that person, which is why you want to have your board president do it. Because then all of a sudden you're, you're kind of conducting a meeting of sorts. So yeah, that's why you have to be careful. But... Um, but certainly for her to put a CC, or whenever the board president putting a CC to everybody is totally fine. But for you to do that, that would be problematic, actually. Yeah. yeah. So just to follow up on that one then, for the board president, is it, is it his or her discretion <coughs> as well? Or is, that, is our protocol that the board president replies to the email and CCs? The rest of the board. I think uh, yes. Now, now here's the thing: the reality is, you have nobody can control your uh, ability to want respond to somebody that you just want to respond to, and you don't have to CC anybody, right? So there's nothing. There's no law that says you don't you don't do that. In some ways, that's the better way. Um, 
and that's that's the, the point I think of the discretion in here. So maybe we do need to be a little clearer about what what we're addressing by having this this here uh, in this way, because I, I I feel like the CCing everybody is really for the board president to do so you all know it was responded to and how she responded. And, and I have to say, I haven't been very good about the CCing part. Okay. Yeah. So well, but you do flag us and say, it. just to let you know, I'm responding right. to these. I do, but right. I don't always send you what I responded. Not as a one-off. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right, and, and like recently when we get so many, you could always say, here's a sample of one mm -hmm. or something, and just know I'm going to respond to all of them that come or something. I think you would all probably <coughs> be mm -hmm. fine with that. Mm -hmm. But what isn't addressed is that question of, well, what about me? I mean, and, and, and so we could just say it, an individual board member <coughs> always has the right to respond to an individual. We're not going to control that, uh, but you have to be careful not to be representing the board when you do that. And I would say in that case, don't CC anybody because that's that's a personal uh, interaction you're trying to have with somebody not <coughs> responding for the board or anything. Well, and I think an example of that would be when you got thrown under the bus last week. Um, you did respond to some of those, but you didn't CC any of us, which I think is appropriate. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So maybe I, I should, uh, without Sorry. us having to get too far into it here, as long as we <coughs> understand the intent of this, right, that, that the intent is, uh, as a board, you're asking the board president to be the really one and only, if you will, responder for the board in relation to email that we get. It would be good to CC or at least once, and then you know, as we just talked and about. And I will, I will, I promise, I right. will be better. And then I can work with, um, I can think through it myself, but also ask legal what's the right way to just add a bullet that says something to the effect of, um, you know, a board member always retains the right to uh, respond individually to somebody as long as she or he is not um, indicating in any way that you're responding responding on behalf of the board, mm -hmm. right? Something like that. So. So I just want to, again, sorry, uh, to, to <coughs> clarify. So in the protocol, it should be that the board president CCs or CCs or BCCs the rest of the board. CC. But not at, at his or her discretion. No. So for the, for the rest of the board members, it can be at his or her discretion. But for the board president, since their responsibility is to respond on behalf of the board, it should be regardless not, not kind of this like, well, this one I'll CC you, this one I won't CC you. So what I think I should have done, these 70 emails that I responded to around age, human growth, I think, and you guys have to agree or disagree, I think what I should have done is on the first, because they were pretty much cookie cutter, um, on the first one I should have CC'd all of you and just you would know then that everything else, all the other 69 that I sent were the same or similar rather than, because yeah. you don't want to get all of them. Wait, is that agreeable? Yeah, and I, I would say that it would be good for you then to maybe just send an email to everyone saying, by the way, I'm not going to CC you on all of them, right. I, but I will respond to all of them. Right. And you get to do that. That's not a Brown Act thing. You can <coughs> you know, information, just pass yeah. that information across. And, yeah. If you're taking a straw poll, I'd rather not have my <laughs> inbox flooded with 70 copies right. of the same thing. <laughs> right, <laughs> but exactly. That's just me. Yeah. I don't know how my colleagues feel yeah. about that. But yeah. yeah. Well, I just wanted to, because right now the bullet says, sent to all, will respond to emails and copy the superintendent, but it doesn't say copy the rest of the board, right? CC other board members and copy the superintendent if needed. I'm not looking at the right section. It says the board president or designee will respond to emails sent to all board members as a group and will copy the superintendent. The so second, we're at the, the second board. board. We're the third bullet, board. individual board members may respond to email, blah, blah, blah. See, I think that's what I'm Craig saying. Oh, talking about the She's third talking line. about Sylvia's the president. Talking right. About the but second I'm, one. right, so what I, what I was suggesting is that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to correct this such that it reflects exactly what we were just talking about, which is she's going to uh, make it clear she um, sends it and she will CC board because th this is mixed up here. So she's going to respond. She and will she copy you board. all. Yeah. That's her responsibility. And then have a bullet that's very clear. This is only about now. Other board members have the ability to respond, and what and how that will go. Which is, you're not going to CC everybody. You, you that, that would be an individual thing, and you'll make it clear that you're not representing the board in responding to them. 
so they, I'm, I'm going to create two bullets. So you're going to fix the second bullet and leave the third bullet the same? Is that what you're going to do? Uh, slightly change uh, that one too, though, actually. Okay. Yeah. The second and the third. Yes. Okay. So any, any other um, items before we talk about board minutes? Was there anything else on there we should talk through or concerns with how we've been doing on our protocol up until that point? Okay, so um, board uh, board minutes. This is this has been, and this is true throughout my career doing this stuff. It's always hard to know how much to put in board minutes. Um, generally speaking, one of the one of the reasons, um, if not the initial impetus for moving to videotaping and posting those, was to get away from having to do really specific minutes. It is really really time consuming. And it's almost impossible to get everything down, and then you're just tr transcribing. And it, so the idea that we're trying to put a lot into board minutes and still do the videotaping and all the work we put in there, and, so, and, and it was supposed to save us money and effort and time, not add to it. But the degree to which we have to you know, be detailed in the written minutes in, as, as opposed to saying, here's basically what we talked about, if there's a resolution of some kind of saying board voted or whatever, and say, to see more, go here and click on it and you can see it, and not have to write things down again. So um, I just want to talk to you about it because as Renee and I have been working on them after board meetings, we've been moving more and more toward, let's try to be really uh, succinct, uh, quick, clear, just what you need to know, uh, the gist of, the, of a conversation without getting into this board member said that, this board member said this, that board member, right? And we'd prefer to point people to the video if that's what they care to get to. So I just wanted to check with you. What are your thoughts? Does that work? Um, are you okay with us being as minimalistic as possible? And frankly, that's especially true when we do the um, board uh, activities and, you're, and you're, you're all listening up, you know, so all of a sudden what, we have a list of 35 things that we're supposed to rewrite on that thing and so one way to do it is say you know just board members talked about various activities including eight you know a few or something and then point them to if, if they want to see it um, but I didn't want people to feel slighted by us doing that but honestly in some ways as soon as you start putting a board member said blank why not say that for the next board member or the next one? so there's no cutoff point at that at that time, so I've been asking Renee to do as little as possible of mentioning any particular board member saying a specific thing, unless it's critical to understanding what took place at that time. So, thoughts? And Jerry, I don't know if you have thought because you you know you're the one who has a first read sure. and helps us sure. edit. I don't yeah, no, I, I certainly would be in favor of I think switching more from these uh, narrative minutes to action minutes. And I think Cupertino yeah. City Council did something similar a couple of years ago. But what happens, it becomes very hard to capture the narrative. It's almost easier for them because they don't, they kind of speak for 10 minutes and each, per, uh, but we tend to have, I'm oh sorry, I shouldn't have, but you know, some, some speak for shorter than that, but it goes on a long time. <laughs> but we tend to be more interactive. And then what happens is it becomes almost impossible to capture that ebb and flow. And you may as well, as long as we're doing video, just stick to, capturing what are the actions or what the exactly. So I'd certainly be in very much favor of this. Um, That's a really good point, the interactive part. It is true, we are less about one person talks for a long time yeah. and then you go to the next, we're much more, and it is, I think for Renee, it's gotta be almost impossible to capture exactly what's being said and by whom. So thought, any other thoughts on that? Minimal minutes and, um, and the video stuff. Okay continue to capture, I know you said not so much the board activity and that's totally fine with me, but the um, agenda requests, those will still go in, right? Anything that gets requested for the yes, agenda? Yes, that, those are easy for us, just yes. the list, it was requested that we bring back for ABC, yeah. Yeah, that would be good. Um, and what about, I have a question on this document, uh, not away from minutes, if we're there, I don't want to yeah. jump ahead. Yeah, yeah. So um, towards the bottom where we talk about the archival, um, it talks about uh, district records may be erased or destroyed 30 days after the meeting. Mm -hmm. I think if we're going to action minutes, and I guess nowadays storage is unlimited, I like to see if we <coughs> revisit that. And, and which bullet is this? Oh, it's down it's at the page, um, page, bottom of page. Just before the legal reference. Bottom of page two. Yeah. Um, down there, if you, okay. right there. It may erase or destroy 30 days after the meeting. 
Um, so I, I think if we go to actually, you know, all the more important, we hang on to the video. So. Um, Indefinitely or extend the period of time? On, I, mean, I think I'm actually thinking I mean years, right? Three, four years at least the term because you may want to go back and see what happened. I, I mean, yeah. you could just put it on YouTube, be there forever. Or, when yeah. Google was or do we yeah. have cloud space that no, we I could? Agree. That's, um, yeah. So if you could just look at that. I, I don't know what the right technical solution is, but I know city council, they just dumped it on YouTube and it's there forever. Right. Um, so. Anyway. Jeff, do you know uh, like what the parameters are on that? It's either three or seven years, and I agree with what Michelle did. Come yeah. 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 The difference with this is, is they I become remember. our minutes. Yeah. I would say gen generically, and I can go back and take a look deeper into this, we typically te keep our most important records for seven years, with the exception of those that are we keep forever. So we have those retention policies as a district. In terms of recordings, I agree that there is no issue with backing it up or anything like that. We, we have really unlimited storage with that. The only thing about this policy, since it does come from CSBA, is I know it's under a May, and I, I think Leslie was saying that too. It is a May, so there are certain times where you may want to have the ability to destroy after 30 days. From a data standpoint, you do need to call out those terms, and so that's simply what you're doing. You may be able to add in additional language under there that says we're going to keep, because our uh, because these meetings act as our minutes for it, we are going to keep them a longer duration of time. That's something we probably could go back and do. I could see us putting something in here that says, you know, it, uh, it's the intent to uh, uh, keep them, blah, 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 for, uh, for a minimum of seven years or whatever we want to say, but it could be forever, too, for, for that matter. Um, still, as a district, is that what it is? For yeah. example. Right. Right, but so video... Yeah, so we, we can take a look at whether it makes sense to do that because this does make it seem like we're going around destroying all of our <laughs> video <laughs> after 30 days so right. nobody knows what we talked about. Can I clarify that? So does that mean anything I'm archiving right now in my email after three years, I'm not going to have access to that archive anymore? Yes, so emails aren't actually a place to store records. They're actually just a place to conduct communication. Drive is where you would keep your records. So when I'm hitting archive, that archive has a time limit to it. Okay. So any any document, and I'm probably stepping out of what we agendize, so Sorry. I'll be very careful. <laughs> Happy to talk about this with anyone, but okay. really for something that is truly important, you should store to drive. Great. Are we done then? Phyllis, did you have anything to add? I didn't. We, um, I'm just a happy camper. Did we eventually, I thought we ended up, we wanted at one point, and I think we raised it a little bit, talk about how we do the the board uh, activity and superintendent activity. We did talk we? about that, but I don't remember that. if we were going to make a suggestion to the board to make changes. Yeah, I can't remember either. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. Okay, very good. So, all right. Round two. Oh, committee responsibilities. We put the committees on here. I believe we posted them, did we not? Yeah. And um, I think I just wanted to go over, and this might be one we bring back later and not spend a lot of time right now. Um, uh, oh, here they are. Yours isn't I'm off the internet again. I don't know what's going on. So um, number one is there a strategic plan is up there. And uh, we're, we're kind of past that as a committee, I think, right now. Our job is to uh, implement those. Uh, I believe what we're doing right now is actually separating the facility from enrollment and making those two different committees, whereas they were functioning in the beginning as um, sort of connected the same, but we've actually split them. So our recommendation is that we're going to bring facility enrollment separately. Um, and then uh, we will continue with a budget advisory. And then the question is, how about those partnerships? Um, and uh, I, I did, um, w I wonder, and maybe we have to hold on to this until we've had a conversation about district priorities and come back to it in a way. But I had also mentioned, as, as Jerry had raised, the issues around uh, contracts with the city and our partnership there and what are we going to raise. I do want to make sure, and again, this might be a good one to push to another day, but I want us to have a conversation about 
when a board member is, let's say, on the facility committee, what, what do all board members hope uh, you are address we are addressing in those committees so that, um, you know, we address those things. So like I know that we want to address in the two by two with Cupertino um, some issues around our, our contractual arrangements and our fields and things like that. We will do that, right? Um, but I think we should do that with each one of these so each of you knows where the committees you're on, what that means. So I guess uh, I'm rambling a little bit, but I'm sort of thinking for saving time that maybe and because we haven't talked about district priorities, we don't know whether we're going to add something in place of strategic planning or not, or uh, or where we are. Does that make sense? Maybe we come back to it, and if there's time today, we could do that, and if not, we'll bring it to a board meeting. My only one was we did reach out to a couple of the cities last year about starting more informal ones, and I just mm -hmm. want to get a consensus that we're, with the other cities that aren't listed here, is everybody still okay with us proceeding with those? Like I know Santa Clara said they were willing to meet with us. I know Chappie said he was willing to meet with you. Uh, on a more informal basis. Yeah. yeah. So are but, we. Right. Which I don't think need to be memorialized as committee in that yep. case, right? But it's right. just that we Yeah, I just consensus that. that everybody's yeah. okay with not formalizing them. Is mm -hmm. that? Yes? Okay. I have a question about separating facilities and enrollment. Does that mean Sylvia and I would serve on both? Um, I think, well, that's what we have to talk about, but it might be we want to um, just split those up. And, and I, I, think, I think once we figure out how many committees are we going to have for what purpose, we can talk about um, how many, who's on what, okay. or because we might right. shift it or we leave it, we're not sure. That's what I mean. I, I think it might be a little more complicated than we can okay. handle today, if that's all right with you. The scope of facilities a little bit, um, since we, uh, earlier I think the emphasis was on facility or the enrollment. I think it was combined, but now the, com the objective itself will become completely different then, right, when you talk about yeah. facility. Yeah, and, and the reality is, uh, and, and budget, because facility, enrollment, budget are all so tied to one another, right? And ballot. I mean, the facility is going to become ballot at some point. So. Uh, for a bond, you mean? Yeah, yeah well, but we'll address that when it comes, but that's different <laughs> from a, a strategic committee yeah. to be working towards something. So, um, I, again, I think I'll, I, we need to bring that back. But, yes, I, I would separate them because we have actually a whole <laughs> process we're going through on facility mm -hmm. that has an outside consultant. If you remember, we hired people who are going to bring information. And so it, it's right now it's a little bit separate. But we will always have overlap of both staff and maybe board members to connect those three areas of budget, facility, and enrollment. And just to explain to you, the the facility master planning is a separate with an end date, right? So when, when we bring to you guys in March and April our work with LPA who's conducting, that ends. These committees here, budget advisory is an ongoing committee. Where facility master plan is, where Jerry and Sylvia have been helping out on it, there is a start date, there is an end date. We then will use that to then come back and talk about enrollment. So then facility and enrollment come back together. And then the other one we'll want to consider is the wellness committee. So um, sometime in September, we'll be sending out information to the community about our plans to um, discuss student nutrition and what we provide for kids, what we're required to provide, and then um, opportunities to explore other options um, or you know adjustments or um, whatnot and so we will be talking to board members about interest in having members on that committee also so that would also be a brown act body then <coughs> yeah, sorry uh, for uh, uh, so this wellness committee would be like PC would be subject to brown uh, sorry brown act and all that too or I don't, to see I don't know that we do have to because it, it's uh, It would be a be superintendent's committee. A, yeah. right, I'm trying to figure out, is it a board committee or a superintendent? Probably superintendent, superintendent yeah. because okay. in nature it's intended to be uh, short term, right. not, right. you know, if it's going to be more than two years and ongoing like the, the budget right. advisory is, then you have to do it that way, but otherwise, no, I, I would start, and if it becomes that, we, would, we could shift it okay. to be, yeah. Okay. Can I ask a clar <coughs> clarifying question about wellness or is that not? Sure. Is that, do we have anything that we're going to have to do as a part of the change in the state law for start times? Does that fall under, or are we exempt from that? Um, that wasn't going to be something that we would explore the next two years in regards to that, so I don't know. I'm not sure if we have to do something in regards to start time, 
but the wellness committee's focus this year will not be on that, although it may be a district focus. Yeah, yes. I, I would say okay. if it emerges from, right, exactly, yeah. um, and if it emerges from conversations during the year that we have to have some sort of committee on it, but that, you know, in the end, if that ends up being truly, and I'm not so sure it will end up going through in it, but if it really does, and that's for us as staff to bring to you, here's how we're going to do that, because that's not, <coughs> it's not a decision around it, right? If a law changes, we have to. Yeah, I, I think what, it, it. what it's jogging for me is that I think that's where the high school district chose to put it, but that doesn't mean we have to put it under wellness. Right, and the high schools tend to be in a different place from, yeah. from yeah. middle school. Okay. Yeah. And each year we've explored different topics, and so it just so happens that this year, and we really think it will take two years to do, okay. that we will really focus as a wellness committee, not only on the wellness policy, but really um, the, the student nutrition um, and what we're providing to kids at schools. All right, can we move on? Great, thanks everybody. Um, so we're moving on to the uh, strategic plan discussion. And, uh, you know, first of all, you, um, you, yeah, what do we have for this today? Um, you know, uh, you've seen and you approved the two page uh, version of the strategic plan plan that looks like that and the second page had the uh, mission the old mission statement I think and the portrait of a CSD learner etc so that's at this point that is the basis of our strategic plan um, and uh, we have primarily been getting good feedback from it uh, from staff and uh, community and it seems to be working for us uh, so far and I don't know if there's anything that's on there that you, uh, I think one of the changes we had up there is the <coughs> each child, whole child, 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 every child, and uh, do you? Yes, I, Thank I you. Love that. <coughs> so, so let's go to the globe then, because I um, that we we played around with a graphic that we've been working with. Our goal is to hire a professional uh, graphics person to say whether this works, doesn't work. Do they have a better idea? But explain why it is the way it is, <coughs> and maybe we'll get three options to look at together at some point. Um, but I would say that uh, staff, in the end, primarily felt pretty good about it. The, the principals, the management team, um, it, it seemed to resonate. It, it's hard to see it here, obviously, and a, a, a professional would do a way better job, obviously, not to insult anybody who may have made this particular uh, globe. Um, our thought is that, that that center part there, we've done different versions with kids in the middle, and we actually thought so that we, you know, start with at the core of everything we do is each child, a whole child, every child, um, and so we thought also, what if we had a little contest with all of the kids and said, do you want to try to make our logo for the middle that we put in the middle of our globe? That that would be a neat activity to do, as well. So we threw that out there. The core of this just tries to take the uh, strategic plan page and the and the half second page and say quickly how do we keep that in front of us in some way and so that's where you have the um, each child every child there we're going to put pictures there the three parts going around it is dynamic learning experiences <coughs> and environments the what's the, the program what is it uh, personalized oh. and targeted yeah. curriculum and instruction and then wellness and belonging so th those were kind of the, um, to encapsulate uh, what w the other parts that were in that strategic plan. And then we ended up putting on the perimeter, which is really hard to read here, um, uh, kind of gets us some more structural things. Do you mind reading it out for me? Highly uh, qualified educators, community partners, responsible stewardship. And my thought was those are the things that are holding that globe up essentially, right, that we can't just do all those things in the center if we don't have the structures in place and the systems and the, the, the stewardship, um, the highest quality educators, uh, all those things. So we, we tried to capture everything that was in that strategic plan in the simplest possible way. And I'm gonna let Leslie talk about any feedback. What I do remember is one of them was they didn't, the principals I think it was, didn't necessarily like the di division <coughs> Of, like they kind of like the idea of the words just going around without it being divided into these segments uh, because then you're trying to line everything up. Um, you know what I mean? That the lines and, and everything that are there. 
And what else do you, did we have anything else on this in particular? Um, yeah, the only other things were, um, <coughs> do we take the lines out? Um, do we make it more of a puzzle piece where it seems where it's <coughs> more integrated? And some of that also came from our, strate our strategic plan steering committee. Right, they had one like um, that. Certainly they wanted it to look more dynamic, sort of a 3D that moves and, right. um, and then um, making sure that the words pop out on the globe, that whatever right. it is, it is lifted off. They also recommended taking it to the next step once we just feel that this is okay to take it to a graphic designer. Yeah. But they loved it. Yeah. Good feedback. And I, I, I would say that I, on just a <coughs> totally personal level, I, I, I don't like puzzle piece versions of anything that's about kids and learning because it kind of, it, it's the opposite of whole, right? It's like you're mm -hmm. putting pieces together. I have all these images of when I was younger that, you know, these things about what, once you rip something with somebody's heart up, you can't put the pieces back together. It's never the same. So I just have a lot of issue with puzzle piece uh, notion of, of this stuff because I want it to be more whole, right? We're talking about the whole. So I, I, I struggle with that personally, but uh, in the end, I would like to <coughs> hand this over to a graphic artist to give us some other ideas. That's my, my real uh, hope that we would do. So thoughts on this? or any of it, the strategic plan, anything of where we are, where we need to go next uh, with these things. Um, so I guess, I guess my first question is, is this graphic supposed to be um, <coughs> just digital? Or is this something that is going to be printed as well? Yeah, I think we, we picture it printed. We picture it being maybe even uh, part of a logo and different pieces of paper or, or you know, that we send out. Maybe it becomes part of, uh, it just kind of depends on, I'm so focused on, oh, it's a globe right now. And so until I know what our graphic ends up really being, I can't say all the pr reasons, but essentially, whatever we come up with, we would want it up and around and people see it, we use it all the time. It's, a, it's an image of remembering what we're about, what we focus on, what our priorities are, things like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, two things, I, I love the concept of the globe. Um, I think it's, I don't, I don't know what to think about whether or not showing North America is yeah. would be an issue or wouldn't we be an issue, that. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I don't know how to feel about that. I do hear the feedback you're saying, and I don't remember if you said it was the principals or the committee, but somebody said, you know, compartmentalizing felt, the, the lines <coughs> felt. And yeah. I guess um, I, I would lean toward that too. I'd like to see something that maybe isn't quite so compartmentalized because I do uh -huh. feel like it's all part of one whole and I guess being the color girl I am <laughs> I see it more as like you know um, the, the everything sort of blending and, and um, you know maybe it's maybe it's ombre shades or something that allows the, the colors to come together that still shows that they are it's not separate pieces I mean they all go together but uh -huh. they are different things that you come in to focus on and then you go back out and look at the whole and then you come in to focus on and you um, so I, I don't know how that translates but mm -hmm. that's just I guess where my brain goes great other thoughts feedback no, I, I like this a lot I just been having seen the evolution of all these ideas coming to this globe I I, I like the metaphor um, I, I guess only feedback maybe is the uh, where it says highly qualified educators you know, I, I don't know, qualified, even highly qualified. I wonder if there's a maybe uh, another word we could use there. I'm not really sure. Accomplished or something. Yeah, or because qualified has a sense of like yeah. that good enough. Or, and I, I don't want something that sh that talks about being superb and being um, maybe a, a punchier word than highly qualified. Uh -huh. But we're down to words. Right. Enough. It sounds kind of technical in a way. Technical, yeah. Right. They, so that's yeah. really the only thing that I, I don't know how all this That's good feedback. Together. I like that. Yeah. yeah. What else? I'm a little torn about about the image. I think digitally, I think it would be really good because I can picture it, mm -hmm. it spinning, and I yeah, can right. imagine the, the yeah. pop outs and the yeah. dynamic text mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Uh, as a printed lo logo or, or image, I guess <coughs> I'm, I'm not.
not as hot on it. Um, it feels more flat, mm -hmm. I guess. Yes. Uh, like, yeah. You know, one of the, um, I, I should have said that one of the um, nuances of it that I actually liked was that right now our logo is a C with kids in it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, with that design, we, I, originally I was thinking maybe we could incorporate somehow, especially the kids in the middle, with that in a way that it actually wouldn't be much different from the current logo. Um, but I, I do know what you're saying about it being kind of stagnant or, or flat um, and not dynamic in that way. So um, I guess I would ask that we just hold off a little bit on Yeah, I don't want to like critique that piece, but right. design, yeah. right? So right. like. And yeah. hopefully a, a graphic artist actually can help us with that because maybe there's actually a way to make it more, uh, less flat. Uh, well, if it's on paper, it's flat. Nothing you can do about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I, I guess because having, again, <coughs> like, like Jerry, going through the evolution, um, I, I had more of an attachment personally to like the journey part of mm -hmm. it, like because we are taking them through this journey and it, it's not totally reflected really in the globe, which is fine, right? It, it's stylistic and it's kind of personal preference, but I guess that's that's my right. kind of. The journey was one of the images that uh -huh. one of the groups drew. Yeah, and uh, that's the other thing. We can share with our graphic designer this. Mm -hmm. We can share the four different images that right. were collected there and um, you know, see with their expertise what their thinking is. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And probably there's a way to include in that yeah. globe thing a journey or something, right? There's a, so maybe that person would Definitely. help us. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I heard somebody yesterday in an interview, I heard use the term, um, two paths, same mountain. I love that notion, you know, that we're all on the same mountain, but we're, we, you go at it with, you know, we take different paths, you know, on that or something. So I, I, I can see adding that somehow in here, but we'll, I'll let somebody way better at this uh, <laughs> deal with that. <laughs> Any other thoughts, feedback? All right. Yay, we're getting closer all the time to, uh, to having this done. Excellent. Um, so, I, you know, our next steps are, as I think you all know, our, our goal right now is to make sure that, first of all, we agree on our um, priorities for this year and that as I talked to all the staff when we did our kickoff is, you know, this is the year to bring to life our strategic, our strategic plan. You know, we're, we are done with that. We've basically gotten good feedback from everybody, and I think folks feel some ownership of it, which is why we spent two years working on it, because we wanted uh, community and, and staff to own it together, and kids, actually, as well. You know? And so I do think adding some element of kids helping us <coughs> with this last phase of it will be helpful, because now we full circle. Um, That's a great idea. Yeah. OK. okay so. What I am going to suggest is that we go to lunch. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> and then because the first thing we're going to do with you is to see a video, not one of the ones we sent you. I'm assuming you all got a chance, hopefully, to it. see those other ones. But yeah, I'm thinking that video would be great for us to watch while eating, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe uh, take another 10 minute break to go get food and come back at, at around 12.15. Perfect. That sense? Sounds all right. good. Good. I think I might be able to get us on, uh, back on track with time. Yeah. Are we, we're good? We're good. We're good to go. Uh, 12.15, we're back. Okay. okay. Are we ready? Okay. We're reconvening. Um, we're going to be showing some videos that may or may not show up today on the video, but it, they will be posted on our website. Yeah. So anyone who wants to view the videos will be able to do that at a later date. Yeah. So here we go. <coughs> so before we do the video and I, I don't know if it's still cued to the beginning or not, I can't tell, it's like it's starting part way through, but what we're about to do is um, the EC came up with some concepts for what might be our district priorities. We uh, shared those with uh, all management when we met uh, earlier this month and, uh, and then uh, with the principals as well and so we've been through a few iterations with that. I showed it to the entire Staff, uh, this one anyway, to all of uh, 
our staff at the kickoff as well, this first one. And the main message of the first one was supposed to go with our first one, although it ties to many of our priorities, um, which was about staying the course. And uh, um, one additional priority we're suggesting is that we just recognize that we have so many things we started in the last two years. And instead of adding more and more and more on all of our staff's plays, let's, 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 ha let's persevere, let's really work on the things that are in front of us and, and uh, honor that. Because I do know that staff often feel that we're just piling more and more on them, right? That's how it feels sometimes. So uh, this one is meant to be, uh, I, and I think it's entitled uh, Never Ever Give Up, and it's Diana Nyad, and uh, you probably know her, but it, and it's a, it is a 15 minute one, so you can eat slowly, don't worry. And uh, we'll talk about it after. It's the fifth time I stand on this shore, the Cuban shore, looking out at that distant horizon, believing again that I'm going to make it all the way across that vast, dangerous wilderness of an ocean. Not only have I tried four times, but the greatest swimmers in the world have been trying since 1950. And it's still never been done. The team is proud of our four attempts. It's an expedition of some 30 people. Bonnie is my best friend and head handler who somehow summons will, that last drop of will within me when I think it's gone after many, many hours and days out there. The shark experts are the best in the world, large predators below. The now the box jellyfish, the deadliest venom in all of the ocean is in these waters, and I have come close to dying from them on a previous attempt. The conditions themselves, besides the sheer distance of over 100 miles in the open ocean, currents and whirling eddies, and the Gulf Stream itself, the most unpredictable of all of the planet Earth. And by the way, it's amusing to me that uh, journalists and people, you know, before these attempts often, you know, ask me, well, are you, are you going to go with any boats or any people or anything? <laughs> and I'm thinking, what are they imagining that I'll just sort of do some celestial navigation <laughs> and, uh, you know, carry a buoy knife in my mouth and I'll hunt fish and skin them alive and, you know, eat them, and maybe drag a desalinization plant behind me for fresh water. <laughs> yes, I have a team. <laughs> and the team is expert. And the team is courageous. And brimming with innovation and scientific discovery, as is true with any major expedition on the planet. And we've been on a journey. And you know, the debate has raged, hasn't it, since the Greeks, of isn't it what it's all about? Isn't life about the journey, not really the destination? And here we've been on this journey, and the truth is it's been thrilling. We haven't reached that other shore, and still, our sense of pride and commitment, unwavering commitment, when I turned 60, the dream was still alive from having tried this in my 20s and dreamed it and imagined it. The most famous body of water on the earth today, I imagine, Cuba to Florida. And it was deep, it was deep in my soul. And when I turned 60, it wasn't so much about the athletic accomplishment, it wasn't the sort of ego of I want to be the first, that's, that's always there and it's undeniable. But it was, it was deeper. It was how much life is there left? Let's face it, we're all on a one-way street, aren't we? And what are we going to do? What are we going to do as we go forward to have no regrets looking back? And all this past year in training, I had that Teddy Roosevelt quote, to paraphrase it, floating around in my brain. And it says, you go ahead. 
You go ahead and sit back in your comfortable chair and you be the critic, you be the observer, while the brave one gets in the ring, gauges, and gets bloody and gets dirty and fails over and over and over again, but yet isn't afraid and isn't timid and lives life in a bold way. And so of course I wanna make it across. It is the goal and um, I should be so shallow to say that this year uh, the destination was even sweeter than the journey. Um, <laughs> but the journey itself was worthwhile taking. And at this point, by this summer, everybody, scientists, sports scientists, endurance experts, neurologists, my own team, Bonnie, said it's impossible. It just simply can't be done. And Bonnie said to me, but if you're gonna take the journey, I'm gonna see you through to the end of it. So I'll be there. And now we're there. And as we're looking out, kind of a surreal moment before the first stroke, standing on the rocks at Marina Hemingway, the Cuban flag is flying above, all my teams out in their boats, hands up in the air, we're here. We're here for you. Bonnie and I look at each other and we say, this year the mantra is, and I've been using it in training, find a way. You have a dream and you have obstacles in front of you as we all do. None of us ever get through this life without heartache, without turmoil. And if you believe and you have faith and you can get knocked down and get back up again and you believe in perseverance as a great human quality, you find your way. And Bonnie grabbed my shoulders and she said, let's find our way to Florida. And we started and for the next 53 hours, oh, it was an intense, unforgettable life experience. The highs were high, the awe, I'm not a religious person, but I tell you, to be in the azure blue of the Gulf Stream, as if as you're breathing, you're looking down miles and miles and miles to feel the majesty of this blue planet we live on. It's, it's, it's awe-inspiring. I have a playlist of about 85 songs and especially in the middle of the night and that night because we use no lights. Lights attract jellyfish, lights attract sharks, lights attract bait fish that attract sharks. So we go in the pitch black of the night. You've never seen black, this black. I can't, you can't see the front of your hand and the people on the boat, Bonnie and my team on the boat, they just hear the slapping of the arms and they know where I am because there's no visual at all. And I'm out there kind of tripping out on my little playlist. <laughs> I've got tight rubber caps. I don't hear a thing. I've got goggles and I'm turning my head 50 times a minute. I'm singing, imagine there's no heaven. Doo -doo -doo -doo. It's easy if you try. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And I could sing that song a thousand times in a row. Now there's a talent unto itself. <laughs> and each time I get done with, who you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. 222. Imagine there's no heaven. <laughs> and when I get to uh, the end of a thousand of John Lennon's Imagine, I have swum nine hours and 45 minutes. Exactly. <laughs> and then there are the crises. Of course there are. And the vomiting starts, the seawater, you're not well, you're wearing a jellyfish mask for the ultimate protection. It's difficult to swim in, it's causing abrasions on the inside of the mouth, but the tentacles can't get you. And the hypothermia sets in. The water's 85 degrees, and yet you're losing weight and using calories. And as you come over toward the side of the boat, not allowed to touch it, not allowed to get out, but Bonnie and her team hands me nutrition and ask me what I'm doing, what, how, how am I all right? I am seeing the Taj Mahal <laughs> over here. I'm in a 
you know, a very different state. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, I never thought I'd be running into the Taj Mahal out here. It's, it's good, gorgeous. I mean, how long did it take them to build that? It's just, just a, you know, so, uh, woo, you know. And then we kind of have a cardinal rule that I'm never told really how far it is because we don't know how far it is. What's going to happen to you between this point and that point? What's going to happen to the weather and the currents? And uh, God forbid you're, you know, stung when you... Bonnie made a decision coming into that third morning that I was suffering and I was hanging on by a thread and she said, come here. And I came close to the boat and she said, look, look out there. And I saw light because the day is easier than the night and I thought we were coming into day. And I saw a, a stream of white light along the horizon. And I said, it's gonna be morning soon. She said, no, those are the lights of Key West. It was 15 more hours, which for most swimmers would be a long time. <laughs> You have no idea how many 15-hour training swims I had done. So here we go, and I somehow, without a decision, went into no counting of strokes and no singing and no quoting Stephen Hawking and the you know, parameters of the universe. I just went into thinking about this dream and why and how. And as I said, when I turned 60, it, it, it wasn't about that concrete you know, can you do it? That, 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 that's, that's the everyday machinations, that's the discipline, and it's the preparation, and there's a pride in that. But I decided to think as I went along about, you know, the, the, the phrase usually is reaching for the stars, and in my case, it's reaching for the horizon. And when you reach for the horizon, as I've proven, you may not get there, but what a, what a tremendous build of character and spirit that you, that you lay down. What a foundation you lay down in reaching for those horizons. And now the shore is coming. And there's just a little part of me that's sad. The epic journey is gonna be over. So many people come up to me now and say, what's next? <laughs> we love that. <laughs> that little tracker that was on the computer, when are you gonna do the next one? We just can't wait to follow the next one. Well, you know, they were just there for 53 hours, and um, I was there for years. And um, so there won't be another epic journey in the ocean, but the point is, and the point was, that every day of our lives is epic. And I'll tell you, when I walked up onto that beach, staggered up onto that beach, and uh, I had, you know, so many times in a very puffed up ego way, uh, rehearsed what I would say <laughs> on the beach. When Bonnie thought that the back of my throat was swelling up and she brought the medical team over to our boat to say, you know, that she's, she's really beginning to have trouble breathing. Another 12, 24 hours in the salt water, the whole thing. And I just thought in my hallucinatory moment that I heard, heard the word tracheotomy. Um, <laughs> And Bonnie said to the doctor, I'm not worried about her not breathing. If she can't talk when she gets to the shore, she's gonna be pissed off. <laughs> but the truth is, all those um, orations that I had practiced just to get myself through some training swims as motivation, it wasn't like that. It was a very uh, real moment with that crowd, with my team. We did it, I didn't do it, we did it and we'll never forget it. It'll always be part of us. And uh, the three things I did sort of blurred out when we got there was first, never, ever give up. I live it. What's the phrase from today from Socrates? To be, to be is to do. So I don't stand up and say, don't ever give up. I didn't give up. There was action behind these words. The second is, you can chase your dreams at any age, you're never too old. 64, that no one at any age, any gender could ever do, has done it. And has no doubt in my mind that I am at the prime of my life today. Yeah.
Thank you. And the third thing I said on that beach was, it looks like the most solitary endeavor in the world, and in many ways, of course, it is. And in other ways, and the most important ways, it's a team. And if you think I'm a badass, you want to meet Bonnie. <laughs> Bonnie, where are you? Where are you? There's Bonnie Stoll. My buddy. The Henry David Thoreau quote goes, when you achieve your dreams, it's not so much what you get as who you have become in achieving them. And uh, yeah, I stand before you now in the three months since that swim ended, I've sat down with Oprah and uh, I've been in President Obama's Oval Office. I've been invited to speak in front of esteemed groups such as yourselves. I've signed a wonderful major book contract. All of that's great and I don't denigrate it. I'm proud of it all, but the truth is, I'm walking around tall because I am that bold, fearless person. And I will be every day until it's time for these days to be done. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. selected those, uh, that particular one, because of this notion of never giving up, that we have a lot in front of us. And uh, I, I do want to mention that there are so, if you hear this again and you just think of all the metaphors for the work that certainly staff feels, um, pr and perhaps you as board members feel the same way about that, uh, you know, reaching for the horizon, but just the hard, hard work. And, for teachers, you know, we lose sight, and, and anybody working with kids all day long in classrooms, it is, uh, it is a journey, and it's hard work all year round to be doing that. And uh, it really is about not, you know, you, there are times in the year, we can all tell you, when the teachers, you can just tell, they're like, oh my God, they need a break, because it is, um, it, it is just a grind, and I, I wanted to honor that uh, with them. And, uh, um, you know, and to note that we've got a lot of things on our plate already and that uh, we, we cannot lose sight of, you know, balancing the budget, uh, still community engagement, partnership, the ed services reform that we were undergoing, including uh, continuing with our special education changes in particular, uh, rolling out the strategic plan and aligning everything. That's a ton of work in and of itself, uh, let alone having other goals. So. Um, so I, I, I use that particular video to give that sense of, you know, never ever give up and um, that's, that's what's in front of us and we're going to try not to add much new to anybody's plate because just the work of getting through the year is really, really hard for everybody. So that was the concept. So uh, we're just recommending that goal, that our priority number one this year is to think about how, <coughs> how we can, uh, you know, accomplish all the things already on our plate. Does that make, make sense to folks? Okay, I'm not sure how you'd measure this particular one, but we don't necessarily have to measure it other than uh, I do think we can continue to, um, we do survey, we do go to the uh, schools this year. We're going twice uh, to the schools. EC is gonna go without me uh, to every single school and I'm gonna do every school myself so that they, we get, they get two chances with us uh, during the year this time and we I think we can gather information about how are we doing around this uh, this goal of staying the course and how are they doing so with that um, I uh, I'm gonna go right to goal number two that says engage with a broad set of st stakeholders to provide consistency in programming and equitable resources to enhance learning experiences and in and environments across all 25 schools so there are a lot of bits and pieces <coughs> of that um, statement right there and what, what a lot of it really is about the consistency of resource and equity equity across all all the schools and we've been talking about the middle school uh, master schedule and uh, trying to have and again we're, we're not trying to get to where everybody is the same we don't want cookie cut in schools but if we have to have enough consistency that we feel it's equitable and fair um, across the district and we still have a lot to do including the C, um, CSD 25 
resources because some schools simply spend more on their children than other schools. And so that's, we cannot lose sight of that. So I just have a couple of comments about that. Under yeah. the middle school master schedule and electives, what's really important to me is that every kid in our school district that's in middle school has a similar opportunity. And that isn't true. Our right. electives are, are scattered, so right. kids that go to one middle school don't have the same opportunities. Ever. That bothers me a lot. Right. So just throwing yeah. it out there. And I'll tell you, the, we've already met with the middle school principals, and uh, they're already working on that. Right now, we've been talking about it for the last two years, but there's always been something else that has kept us from prioritizing it, but we've made it clear this is the year we're gonna do it, and in fact, by February, we have to have a new plan so that they can <coughs> um, make new schedules for next year, because that's always what happens is you work on it, and but you get to a point where you can't, you can't talk anymore because you have to make your schedule, and they start doing that in February, and so that gets in the way, and so we, we prioritize and said that we're really gonna work on that one this year. So my, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to change yeah, this. One question here is this, this process of, of, you know, not everybody applies will get it, right? So kind of uh, how, you know, many parents ask that, how do they, or how is this being done? Kind of like, is it, is it a pick again, random pick, or some of the electives, not everybody, for example, language, if you want, or a zero period, whatever. So if you're asking for uh, in middle school, then uh, not necessarily you will be a CB guaranteed, right? So how does it, how is, how is the process? Uh, I'm gonna, uh, we will spend a lot of time talking about process if we get into that right now. And what I'd like to ask is that we can bring that back to you because part of the problem is um, it's done differently in five different middle schools. And that's one of the things we're trying to address, right? So um, because today we're just talking about are we agreeing that that's a priority, that this is something we need to work on and just know, and if it is, then we're gonna bring you a whole bunch of information around that going forward. That's, that's our hope, All right? And my other thing is about the third bullet. Um, I'm sort of lost in revenue enhancement. Um, I'm not sure how CUSD 25, our enterprise, the dawn to dusk and the preschool and CEAF and parcel tax or bond or whatever. I'm not sure how that all works together in terms of revenue enhancement, and I'm not sure the community is sure about that. So I don't want okay. any answers today, but I right. so those I, are we I would need address. some clear right. I really need some clarity around that right. and, and some direction. So right. as we move forward that's something I would be interested in. Yes. That's, and that's definitely planned, mm -hmm. yes, yes. So I would echo what Phyllis said about the middle school master scheduling and the, and the electives in particular. I think the other thing that I think I've shared with you is on my radar is the instructional minutes. So I hope when we do oh, absolutely. have a conversation about yeah. that, that that's something that for, m huge. for me is a big equity issue as well. Um, that is, uh, just to be clear, that is part of the master schedule. It, it includes <coughs> that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. And then um, I... I would call out that second bullet. Um, I do hope that we have the will as a board to continue um, discussing balancing enrollment. It, it's gonna be a challenging topic, but I think it's one that's been a long, long time in coming in this district. And I, I, as hard as it's gonna be, I think we have to have the tough conversations and set some stakes in the ground around, um, you know, what is a right size school for us because if we continue down the path we've been continuing down if it hasn't already it will impact the education that we can provide to all of our students and so we're not doing a service to our kids if, if we don't make some of those have some of those tough conversations and make some of those tough decisions so um i i'm glad to see that on the list and i know those aren't going to be easy but I, I hope we stay the course with that I had, uh, as Ms. Holder is till the end, I wanted to, maybe we could talk a bit about what does it mean to be a priority? Because what I see on that list, and, and it's, it's a good list, but I see, uh, you know, things I would call as values, right? Ensuring students are at the core, that's really a value. There are things that are actions, like we're gonna, uh, you know, build this and build that. And then there are things that are results, like having a balanced budget. And so I'm, I'm sort of looking at all this, and so there are a variety, so are we, is it a priority? Is a synonym for this a sort of to-do list for next year? What does it mean to be a priority? Because I, I feel like everything I can yeah. think of is on here. And then I start thinking, what is it that we're not doing to pr 
because one way of thinking about priority is that's how you guide your resource allocation. Right, right, right. So are these things that we should remember? Are these things that we're going to put more resources into? Are these, is this a to-do list? Right, so um, I, I'm glad you're asking yeah. that. So, um, uh, so putting it in perspective, uh, the primary guide for us is our strategic plan going forward, right? <coughs> and then our LCAP is sort of the implementation plan, if you will, relative to that. So we have a lot of detail in there. So if you look in there, you will see 300 times anything that is implied here, right? Uh, and then you have the SIPSs at the school sites that are aligned to that that are also very detail-oriented about what's getting done. These are intended to be as a board and district at the end of the day when we ask ourselves in this year, in one, and that's one year in nature, saying how do we do in making progress toward the strategic plan? And so we're looking and saying, hey, if this year, for example, if we don't make some progress in relation to the middle school electives and, and, and building equity and really doing something there that is measurable, then we haven't really made enough progress toward the strategic plan in some way. One year goals by which you evaluate me for how are we doing making progress. That's what its intent is because if you don't do that, it's just too broad to look at all the SIPSs, all the LCAP, all the, it, it, like, and w which one are you going to measure as success or not? So, so these are meant to be almost, in a way, success measures for the year, and perhaps, as you say, there's some relationship between this and um, our sort of evaluation, I guess, either as a board or a superintendent. Yeah, and I think what we'll do at a later date, probably we won't have time today. If we had enough time today, we might have gone through and said, so wh what does success look like in each of these? But what we are will the measures, do that. Yeah. yeah, what are the measures? What are Exactly, and we may get to that today. Uh, it was on the docket, but I, we may bring it back because usually we do take a few meetings before we finalize this anyway. Yeah. Okay. So that's the intent. Um, I just want to point out that in the end, though, number two, while we're talking about some of those nitty-gritty things we have to do, they are in service of enhancing the learning experiences and environments for our kids. Um, so they aren't in isolation that somehow equity in and of itself is is the right thing. It's right because all kids get to have a certain kind of learning environment and experience at school. So I don't want to lose track with that. With that in mind, I have one other shorter uh, video that's kind of fun, and that's going to be our last video, and then we're just going to talk about the other three after that. Okay. And uh, yeah, that first video and this one were kind of named as the favorites of the, of the groups that we showed it to, and so we thought we'd, we'd show it. And, and the next one is really focused on Let's think creatively about learning environments, and that we're not just talking about the walls of a classroom, but what I if we're going to be true to the strategic plan, up. how bold I will we be in thinking about learning like experiences and environments? And one of the things about Diana's video that I think is important as well is perseverance is a really important topic for kids as well. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. And yeah. so I, I, that rung a bell with me is that that's what we want our kids to do. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I loved her quote about the funny one about what, what were they thinking? Yes, I have a team, <laughs> and that team is expert, and that team is courageous, and that that always speaks to me. That's 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 who we are as an organization. It, we think it's that lonely experience on the ocean in my classroom. I close the doors, I do my thing, but it's really <coughs> it's the team, and it's the expertise and the courage of that team that really pushes us, us toward our strategic plan. So. And when I did this with the, the whole uh, district, I used some of the quotes from it and tried to push on on it a little bit more. And I did not show all the videos with them. I only with the whole staff. I only did the Diane and I. Had. Interesting. Can we take a moment? <laughs> and we should make sure the closed captioning is on this one too when it comes. So I do, I, we do a kickoff uh, at the beginning when all the teachers uh, come back and everybody, <coughs> and then we broadcast it to the entire, every school. And the, so they're sitting in their staffs and, and then the Lawson community and district office and other people are with me in, a, in the gym and so we broadcast it everywhere. Lori came and gave an opening um, remark to the to people. Yeah, I wasn't here, yeah. so. <coughs> yeah. Kindergarten, we designed 2007, 
And we made this kindergarten to be circle. It's a kind of angel circulation on top of the roof. And if you are parents, you know that kids love to keep making circles. And uh, this is how rooftop is looking like. And when we are designing this, principal of this kindergarten said, no, I don't want handrail. I said, it's impossible. But he insisted. And how about having a net sticking out from the edge of the roof so that we can catch the children falling off? <laughs> I said, it's impossible. And of course, the government official said, of course, you have to have a handrail. But we could keep that idea around the trees. There are three trees popping through. And we are allowed to call uh, this rope as a handrail. But of course, rope is nothing to do with them. They fall into the net. And you get more. And more, more. <laughs> Sometimes 40 children are on the tree. And uh, the boy on the branch, he loves the tree, so he's eating the tree. <laughs> and at the time of event, they sit on the edge. <coughs> it looks so nice from underneath. Monkey in the zoo. Feeding time. <laughs> okay. And we made the roof as low as possible because we wanted to see children on top of the roof, uh, not only underneath the roof. And if the roof is too high, you see only the ceiling. And the lake washing place, there are many kinds of water taps. Uh, you, know, you see that the flexible shoe that is the one to spray f water to your friends, and the shower, and the one in front is quite normal, but you know, if you look at this, the boy is not washing his boots, he's putting water into the, his boots. <laughs> okay. Uh, this kindergarten is completely open most of the year. And uh, there is no boundary between inside and outside. So it means, basically, this architecture is roof. And also, there is no boundary between classrooms. So there is no acoustic barrier at all. You know, when you put many children in a quiet box, some of them get really nervous. But in this kindergarten, there is no reason they get nervous because there is no boundary. And the principal says, if the boy on the corner don't want to stay in the room, we let him go. And he'll come back eventually because the circle comes back. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, you know, in that kind of occasion, usually children try to hide somewhere. But here, just they leave and they come back. It's a natural process. And uh, secondly, we consider noise is very important. Right? And you know that children uh, uh, sleep better in noise. They don't sleep in quiet space. And in this kindergarten, these children show amazing concentration in the class. And uh, you know that, you know, we are the kind grown up in jungle with the noise. They need noise. And you know, you can talk to your friends in noisy bar. You're not supposed to be in silence. And uh, you know, these days we are trying to, you know, make everything under control. You know, it's completely open. And uh, you should know that uh, we can go to ski in minus 20 degree in the winter. In summer, you go for swimming, the sun is 50 degree. We are the kind. And also you should know that you are waterproofed. You never get melt <laughs> in rain. So children were supposed to be outside. So that is how we should treat them. 
And this is how they divide the classrooms. They were supposed to help teachers. They don't. <laughs> I didn't put him in. And the classroom, and the wash basin. They talk each other around the well. And uh, always there are some trees in the classroom. A monkey trying to fish another monkey <laughs> from above. <laughs> monkey. <laughs> and uh, each classroom has at least one skylight. And this is where Santa Claus comes down at the time of Christmas. And this is a next building, right next to the oval-shaped kindergarten. And the building is only five meters tall. And of course, ceiling height is very low. So we have to consider safety. So we put our children, daughter and son. They try to crawl in. He hit his head. He's okay. His skull is quite strong. He's resilient. It's my son. <laughs> and he's trying to see if it is safe to jump off. And then we put other children. Traffic jam is awful in Tokyo, you should know. <laughs> Bad driver in front. You know, she needs to learn to drive. And now, you know, these days, kids need small dosage of danger, right? And in this kind of occasion, they learn to help each other. This is society. This is a kind of opportunity we are losing these days. Now, this drawing is showing the movement of boy uh, between 10 past 9 to uh, 30 past 9. And the circumference of the building is 183 meters. So it's not exactly small at all. And this boy made 6,000 meters in the morning. But the surprise is not yet to come. The children in this kindergarten makes 4,000 meters as average. And uh, these children have the highest athletic abilities amongst many kindergartens. And the principal says, I don't train them. We deep them on top of the roof, just like a sheep. <laughs> they keep running. <laughs> My point is uh, don't control them. You know? Don't protect them too much. And uh, they need to tumble sometimes. They need to get some injury. And uh, that makes them <laughs> learn how to live in this world. I think architecture is capable of changing this world, you know, life of people. And this is one of the attempts to change the life of children. Thank you very much. what's uh, behind it is you know just think about the design principle that um, drove the making of that school and that's really what I feel we need to do especially with things like master schedule and because people tend to go back and think about a master schedule as uh, the be all end all not 
well, wh wh what, are we, what are we designing for, right? What, what kind of a learning experience do we want kids to have? Should it be six uh, periods or seven periods? That's not really the question. What's the learning experience? And therefore, how are you gonna design it? You don't have to do a master schedule. How many electives do we want kids to have? Why, what kind of experience? Um, I, I was fortunate enough in San Carlos <coughs> to be able to build a couple of schools that are fairly innovative, not quite like that. But when you get to think of design principle, that then drives the teaching and learning in a different way, you know, and, and having doors that open up so that you can have the doors open all the time. Kids are meant to be outdoors more than we have, and putting the 35 kids in a room all day long to be together is actually not a natural thing at all, and yet we are so used to it that it seems normal to us. So I'm hoping that in designing that strategic plan, we were thinking about not now how do we apply the strategic plan to fit our schools, but the other way around. How are we going to shift our thinking and our, our design around schools? This is the message I'm trying to give the, the teachers and everybody is that now that we have a strategic plan, we have to design for something different. It might take us 10 years, because I mean obviously to build something like that's gonna take you a really long time, um, but it isn't just about that architecture, it's the greater architecture of the learning experience. So that was the intent there and to just know that all the things that we want to do are tied to that notion of that kind of learning experience that we design for our kids. So, uh, moving on to three, then and we're not gonna do more videos here, but I, I'm hoping to get some, good, get some feedback on <coughs> the other three that we had made. Uh, and so maximize resources, enhance working conditions, and support our staff to ensure CSC is the place they want to work. So really, this, uh, the shorthand of this is COC is the place to work. The reality is that we're going to have to think about how do we provide more um, salary increase, uh, remuneration for our staff, because at some point um, we, we can't just keep paying them the same things that are getting paid right now, and that's gonna be really tough for us when we um, have such a budget situation, right? So that's our challenge, but that will be a part of the quotient, but we also know that people do like working in, in, in this district, and there are other things we can do to honor, honor the profession, honor our teachers, provide working conditions that um, are conducive to being in a happy place. Uh, I think we shared with you the happy place uh, video, is that one of them, uh, that um, gentleman did, that's kind of funny. So that part of that was, and, and I think th I focused a bit on this a lot with the staff when I did the kickoff, but you know, this, this means a lot to us, and it's a big deal. <coughs> that we're able to make this that place um, where um, people want to work. And so I'm hoping just kind of, and without, we're, we're a little tired of the term morale. You have to have, oh, morale is really low because people bring that up throughout the year uh, in, in various different ways, but it, it's, it's bigger than morale. You know, it's like, it truly like, this is, this is a, a learning environment that people want to be in, that kids want to be in, that parents want to be involved, and, um, uh, and that we're in it together, all of that. Um, so we're, we think that we have to focus on that this year, especially this year when we have less money um, to uh, spend than other years when negotiations might allow us to do something. Um, we stretched big a year and a half ago when we gave a 7% raise. That was, you know, you all know we were in tough financial time, but we felt that was so important to do for our staff. But now we are living with less money because of having stretch but we have to figure a way now to get through that and provide all sorts of um, um, support, you know, professional development support, any kind of support we can for our teachers. Make sense? Any thoughts on this one? And again, those bullets weren't meant to be, um, you know, all inclusive or anything. That was just giving a few ideas of the kind of things we mean. Um, and, and that balancing equity with flexibility is really important to them. So as we work towards equity, if they see us working, call, uh, saying equity, but what we mean is every school is cookie cutter the same, that doesn't go over well. Or if the district's thing is everybody will teach this exact number of minutes exactly this way, that, that removes that, a certain autonomy and flexibility that makes them the professionals that they are. And so we have to, balance these things off and say, well, there are certain things, and that's true, like I said, with the, uh, the uh, master scheduling, everything, it's a balance. Uh, there are some things you get to do more autonomously, but there's a lot everybody has to provide because it's fair for all of our kids. If we offer something for some children, we ought to offer it for all the kids if we think it's a value. All 
All right, any questions or thought on that one? I was just wondering, some of these, um, you know, uh, some of these examples that you pulled out, are, are these driven from, I, I, I imagine we must use some sort of a staff survey in terms of what they like and don't like and all that, yeah. just a general, I, you know, many organizations do that. Is this sort of driven off of that or what's... what's yeah, the, I, I would say, that we would say that a lot of it came from our EC visits where, you know, we went around and we just say to people, how's it going, what do you want us to know, and... Uh, I would say uh, over the two years, it's been pretty consistent, very consistent. We take notes, we write them all down, we show it, we share it, right? So um, it is very much, th these are very much driven from those things that they're telling us. And obviously some of it is money, but a lot of it has to do with the flexibility, autonomy, uh, professional judgment and trusting that professional judgment, things like that come out for sure. Thanks for asking that. Other questions, thoughts? All right, uh, then we put build site leadership and create programs to support early implementation of a personalized learning approach and the development of the whole child. Um, Leslie, was this one of the ones that they had other wording for? I think part of it was that it sounded like we aren't already doing personalized learning or some of these things, but in fact, site leadership in that direction. But. And then the only other one that they commented related to the video in this one was, um, and it actually tied back to staff, was making sure that we, as like the phrase, know my face, know my, know my name, know my story, and not just for kids, but for the adults in our system, know who we are and care about us as individuals. Yeah. It kind of goes up to number to three. three and yeah. four together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I do think that the strategic plan does make a firm statement about the individual child, uh, personalizing learning, each child, whole child, every child, and so that um, that sounds uh, easy enough, but it's not, right? And 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 a lot of teachers say, oh, I do that, but I, I think we mean something more than what uh, some some people uh, think of when we talk about personalizing learning. So uh, I do think this is an important year for us to make some real inroads in that, in that area. And I do think we can set some targets that we can measure around that, uh, making that progress. Would you expect to see some um, elements of personalized learning across all the grades this next year? Or are we probably targeting some specific grade levels? That's a good question. Um, I, I do think I guess I would say it would be too much to think that we all of a sudden will have across an entire district a lot going on uh, in, in any one school. Um, but I do think that it, it will be every school has some set of people working on some level on, on it, I think mm -hmm. would be how yeah. I think. biggest opportunities this year that would be common would be the implementation of reading workshops so going from one reader that everybody uses to the you know reading at your own level and having personalized goals so we have a lot of schools implementing this year and some who are continuing from last year <coughs> and then of course our shifts in math and how we're supporting sixth grade math teachers in looking at personalized learning um, as we work with the principals even starting this Monday, we'll be starting to circle back to the strategic plan and having them lift up other ways that wouldn't be common but are unique to the site so that we can have that dialogue with the principals to you know, lift out the ways that they're doing these, these things already or ways that they're planning to based on their success. So um, we want to move together and also make space for that uniqueness and really share across schools through the principals meeting. So I would think rather than see it by grade level, you would more see it by school because I think it depends on the readiness of the staff and the leadership of the principal. So I, I think you're gonna see variations across the district, but I, I don't think you'll see it by grade level. I think you'll see it by school. Yeah, but the basis behind my question is really when we publicize this, parents are gonna see this and they're gonna have, you know, are their kids being exposed to this? And I'm trying to get a sense for 
would two thirds of the parents feel like they're getting this, or is it a third? Or that's really the basis behind the question, and that's what I was asking about the grade levels. How, when we get this out there, are they going to feel like it applies to them, or is this just you know some specific? But I, I understand what you're getting at. It's, it's sort of work getting started, and there are a number of things that's in progress right, right now. And okay. And we can have the, the, uh, for the that very point you're making. I actually think it will be important that the principals, when they're coming together, they're sharing ideas and everything, and they are going back and talking to their parents mm -hmm. about. By the way, here let, let us highlight some of the personalized learning that's going on and how we're focusing on the development of the whole child. I do think every single school will have. Um, that work going on yeah. in some form or another, and you're right, we have to then highlight that, otherwise it's gonna be, oh, wh where is that, when is it, let alone do the parents even know what we mean by the development of the whole child or personalizing learning. I, I, I think you make a good point in, that in having the site leadership specifically talk about that. So let's say we're doing something in fifth grade, that way even if you have a second grader that may not be doing so much of that, knowing that that's in the future because school's rolling that out, it's important. It's just yeah. in, in terms of having building community support and buy into something like this. People have to feel like this will impact them in some way. That's really right. right. Which is, uh, I'm glad you said that's why we said that we'll change it to support site leadership. Mm -hmm. Because that's where we actually mm -hmm. think the work is and that's where our emphasis right. is. Instead of thinking about it so broadly, is how do we build that leadership at the site to be able to lead this sort mm -hmm. of a, uh, endeavor? Did you want and to? for me, as, as I go around and visit schools, um, I'm not exactly sure what to look for. I'm not sure when I look at what's going on in a classroom, mm -hmm. how I would know it in a five minute visit to a classroom, how, how would I know if personalized learning is going on in that room, or would I? So would I have to room. have more experience uh -huh. in that classroom to know that? I'm not sure. I think that feels like one of the most exciting parts of this year is now that we, we've committed to the idea, but then making space for those conversations around what do we mean by that? What, what would the evidence what be? Like? Yeah, yeah, because it, it can be things like Readers and Writers Workshop, but it, it could also be something like project-based learning, where the kids are going after their, mm -hmm. their inquiry questions. So there's a lot of different elements of that, so building, building up that shared understanding together, and then we had committed to working on um, bringing the strategic plan to life on the website. So as we identify those examples, we can start making those clickable sections where, where people can say, I wonder what this means. Oh, it looks like this or this or this. And, and that will evolve, I think, as we work on it together. So, yeah. When I think, I think Jerry's spot on with um, t telling the story of that mm -hmm. is speaks to the bigger kind of whole child, every child, in terms of the engagement that you have at home. I mean, mm -hmm. I... I know it's just one example, but you know, just in my time between my two boys, rolling out something like Seesaw <coughs> at Montclair mm -hmm. and the ability to be able to see mm -hmm. into my child's classroom totally <coughs> changed my understanding of what was going on. Um, and so I think opportunities like that to engage the parents only, only help with the learning for mm -hmm. the kids. So I think one thing that I'm thinking about with especially I guess number three um, and related to Lori's point with engaging the parents or kind of engaging the community because there's mm -hmm. other ways to kind of like first line the community engagement which is keeping that momentum going um, especially as I'm thinking about the 25 coalition and like it's not oh I guess it is kind of engaged by the set of stakeholders but we try to embed it in a yeah. few of them in various ways. That a lot of this is about still engaging that broad set of stakeholders yeah. and communicating. And we ended okay. just, just by way of uh, reminder, or may, maybe news, is that we've always, um, at some point, we we've always gone back and forth between: Do you have a separate thing about communication and how uh, uh, priority around it? Or do you make the, um, the communication a constant thread through everything we do that we're doing a good job of communicating? So I, I think it is implied here that we will continue, and that's why it's you know, in the keep the momentum as well, is that we will continue to uh, be proactive um, in telling our stories and talking about all of this. I'm, I'm not so much thinking about the communication, but I'm thinking about some way in which we partner with the parent 
community to do some of these things. Um, so I meant the engagement part of it, though. That's uh, for me. Communication and engagement are going together. Okay. Yeah. Like, so the example that comes to mind quickly for me is like our, you know, well with like Clipco, we gave teachers money to, and they could buy flexible furniture for their classroom, that kind of stuff, which enhanced their classroom environment. But it was like parents got to help them with those things, and then it became more, there was more investment in the classroom from the parent community because they were the ones helping to do that. I, I, don't know, I know that can't be replicated everywhere, but I'm just wondering if there's a way to somehow take that same idea or something like that. Or if that can some if if that's worth somehow including in in that. In this program, we talk about. Uh, I'm looking at three mentioned. specifically, yeah. I guess. It's mentioned in one also. It is yeah. So the community part is mentioned in in one. The community engagement. I guess it 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 struck me when I was looking at three because I was thinking about enhancing working. Con I guess I latched on to the phrase enhanced working conditions and then it just struck me, oh, this is a way that we could potentially also. The other thing that came up from principals was whether or not we take number one and we make that a preamble, which would then mean a lot of what's in number one falls into the others. And so um, but that's the only other item because I think the intent was <coughs> everything that is in number one really does flow into the others that fall below. And I, as part of what you're raising, I'm not sure how to think of it as a priority like a, for yeah. us as opposed to maybe that is one of the indicators yeah. of having been successful in some of the things. Yeah, you know. I think you're right. It's not necessarily a priority. It's more a method in which to measure execute. it that way. Right. So we might want to as our measures is collect some ways in which these things are happening um, across the district. Yeah. All right. Um, so that last one there is, I think, you know, we, you know, it's toward the end of doing all this work that we realized that um, we also had just a whole thing around data and using data to inform what we do, and that even though we do a ton of data collection as a district, we're not necessarily that good at actually using those data to inform what we do next. And that, that we know that that's an, an important thing for a high quality organization is that you, you base your decisions on fact and, and data information. And as I talked to the staff about it, um, and you know, our, our thoughts and feelings and emotions are data too. It's not just a hard data in a cold way, but it's actually uh, the human side of it and, and stories and anecdotes and um, maybe videos that we take or, uh, but it is also for sure, well, what about the achievement gap? How are our second language learners doing compared to others? What about our special needs students? Are they learning at a reasonable pace um, along with their peers? If not, what are we gonna do about it? What does the data say? So, and in fact, as a board, um, we've rarely done that here at board meetings um, where other districts, a lot of their board meetings are around looking at data and part of it is our kids generally do really, really well. So when you have 90% of your children performing at or above grade level, you tend not to pay attention to, let's say the other 10%, but 10% of our kids is a lot of kids, right? And so what are we doing in, in relation to focusing on the kids who are not achieving at a level that we feel they could and should? So anyway, that, that's what this is meant to do, is to say, as a culture, as a whole district, can we be more data-driven than we are right now? I think, a, I don't know if it's a, a measure or just a thought that goes along with that one. I, I absolutely support where you're going with this. I also hear the feedback sometimes that there's sort of a sense that sometimes it's that we're not collecting the right data and sometimes it's that we're collecting data that then, kind of to your point, doesn't necessarily translate into what's the most useful data for us, and so then it becomes sort of more of that, it, it, that we were talking about in a different place, one more thing, right? Um, sort, of, sort of thing, and I don't, know, I don't know if there's a way to capture a measure that's, you know, 
finding ways to be smarter or more efficient uh, around uh -huh. our data um, as a way of helping um, toward that notion of, of not one more thing, you know, uh, re refining maybe is the better word. I, I don't know. I don't know what it. Yeah, I think um, I think for all of these, if it makes sense to everybody here, maybe the next step is for the EC to think through a few core measures that you think might make sense. I mean, bring it to another meeting, and then you can shoot those down and or add your own or change them, and we'll because I do think it's going to be important for us to understand on a um, measurement side how will we know that we are making sufficient progress in these areas. I don't I don't see us like all of a sudden we become these things this year, right? But uh, making progress toward that, I, I believe we can make progress in all of these areas. And then I think we should name some measures of, the, of that success. Um, are there, I know it's hard at this point and uh, it's getting late, but as when you step back and think about what the strategic plan means to you and the things that stand out to you, is there anything missing in terms of what we need to focus on this year to feel good about making progress toward that strategic plan, toward what we said in the strategic plan? Mm -hmm. And again, it's going to be that we need time to chew on this a little bit before we can say, but. Uh, I think for me, when I talk to a lot of there's sort of, um, my, my sense is there's sort of a vague understanding that there's some kind of plan being worked on, right? And exactly what it is, so, uh, you know, we haven't really publicized it. I think it would be important this, this first year to be able to, to do some things to show concrete differences. Because I, I think, you know, honestly, a lot of work, I, at work I do a five-year plan every year. Um, it's just a thing that people do in corporate America to, you know, and, and so, um, you know, I, I really like for this to mean something and to get support. And, and so I think, I think that that's, it's maybe not quite your asking, but I think when we think about the measures and the goals or are there some things we can do this year so people can see, wow, like they concrete. spent this time doing this and it made a difference. Are there some low hanging fruits we can pick up to show people this isn't just a plan? Yeah, so. That may be a site by site thing, Perhaps just depending on where they are. Yeah for them to be able to say concretely, here are some things that we, the progress we feel we can make in these areas and be able then to share that with their parent community along the way. You know, and have conversation, not just share it one way, it can be engaging around it. You can say make it concrete so it's uh, tangible. Something they can see. Um, because some of these are really things like continuous improvement. This, these are things we need to invest in our infrastructure um, but it's not something necessarily the community sees that we're now, you know, data-driven decision making, right? And so, so I think, uh, so it's important we should do that. But emphasizing it because of this, um, n now this is something that is different than before, mm -hmm. hopefully better than before. So, yeah, yeah it's one thought. One of the things that troubles me um, a lot is. We're a high-performing district. We're seen as a high-performing district. Our kids do really well, but we still have kids that struggle. And I, I constantly am concerned that we're putting enough support and enough strategy in place to help those kids be successful as well. So um, that's just kind of a, I think that's a challenge in a high-performing district to make sure that those that those students are coming along as well and we're not just focusing on the kids that are doing well. Yeah. Agreed. So we'll do a lot of talking this year around MTSS and, mm -hmm. and the work we're doing and hopefully be mm -hmm. able to be concrete about things that we're mm -hmm. doing and hopefully what the results are of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think what's, what's triggering for me with what Phyllis just said and also what you just said is I, I think it is super important to have those district-wide conversations. I think something is this maybe a, 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 a 
to strive toward too would be to, to take that piece of all the way down to the level of the individual child, right? It, it's, it's, as a parent sometimes, you know, to understand whether or not something is personalized or targeted to your kid, you're relying on that maybe that one little capture you have at back to, you know, at the conference at the end of the year, you know, it, it, that, that may be really your only chance to understand what is personalized or targeted for your child and, and maybe, maybe there's a room to, to expand our, our family's understandings of that and how it plays out all the way down to that level. I mean, I mean, I think the big picture conversations for us are super important, but I also think there's, there's something there around each parent understanding for each child what that translates into. Well, and along that line, I was impressed last year with my, my five schools that I was supposed to so focusing on. When I met with them about their SIPSs, mm -hmm. I was impressed that the principals were able to tell me by name, mm -hmm. if I wanted them to, yeah. the kids that they were concerned about and working on and bringing up and, and providing special stuff for. Um, I think that's fairly new in the district. I don't, I'm not sure that's always been true. And I was impressed that that um, is happening. I to what extent they share that with the parents, Lori, I don't know, but. Yeah. <coughs> Hello, we're here um, I know, are we comfortable with where we've landed so far? And we will bring back more conversation on the priorities, timelines, um, and, and I do want to make measures. sure we, yeah, yeah. we yeah. address measures. At some yeah, a lot of yeah. a good conversation around the measures. Sound good? Uh, just one other observation when I first was reading this. Um, these five phrases were sort of structured in a, we're going to take some action to achieve some result. Each one of these is phrased that way. Um, I tend to think, and, and it, you know, I think you can, uh, so it, it tends to emphasize the actions a little bit more because you have to go and really parse the sentence to figure out what's the result we're trying to get. Um, I'm, I'm not saying we change it, just want to sort of, I was aware of this, that it took me a little bit of work to figure out you know, we're, we're doing, we're maximizing resources. Why? And I had to parse that. So that might be just something to think about, especially when we're thinking about what the measures are. You know, these actions that we're taking, what is it that we're trying to drive towards? I think it's mostly in there, um, but quarter of report. Um, yeah. I think, uh, are you wanting that to be like a separate bullet called out under each one? Not a separate I bullet. I, I guess for me, I, I tend to, I. Uh, and, and that's why I was asking about priorities in the beginning is what does it mean for you? For me, it tends to be results because I then use priorities to just, it's like why would you ever have any sort of strategic plan? I think a lot of that is really to guide decision making down the line, right? Because a lot of times we're caught up in specific tactical situations and it's like it's good to have that guidance that this is where we're trying to get to. And so therefore, I tend to think of priorities more as results as opposed to values like I won't pull your hair. That, uh, that's just something I should remember. I'm not going to put it as a priority, right? And as opposed to maybe work with Lily more on something, that might be a priority. For me, priorities, things are that are that are temp that have a temporal duration. If something's going to be on there year after year after year, I would question if that's really a priority because it tends to lose, you know, for me, and, and again, this is just sort of my way of thinking and just sharing, is that these things, they should, you might have it for a year or two, but it shouldn't be there year after year just because, um, to me, you're, you're trying to get something done um, anyway. But different ways of looking at it, it's getting kind of philosophical. Um, so yeah, not just throwing it out there for sharing. So, yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you. Are we ready to move on? I think so. Okay, so next on the agenda is board and superintendent activities. Anybody want to start? I'll just uh, mention, so I was at the uh, Cupertino City Council meeting this past Tuesday. There was a major item on there about Valco. And the thing I know, there were a lot of speakers. And, and I, so what was heartwarming for me was that whether whichever side you're on on the issue, most speakers, I think, talked about wanting to help and help our schools. Um, and You've done a good job, Dr. Baker, in terms of informing people of our financial situation. That's That was there, and so I thought that was good. Um, but though there was a comment made on the dais about how 
oh, um, that CUSD would love to have a 4,000 unit development because they really need the students. <laughs> and, and I think my understanding of where we are right now is we're mutual on such things. I, I think I like what Lori says about a student's a student's a student. And I, I understand our position to be organically, whatever happens, whatever students you send us, we'll try to educate them. But we're not really trying to say, um, get more things built so we get more kids in here. Because I think your analysis, I, one of the things I really like what you've done with CSD 25, that presentation, it, it pointed to me that the, our problem is, in some sense, really the amount of dollars we get per student. So there's that shortfall. And if you just get more kids in here, yeah, there's some overhead, but that doesn't, we're, we're still at $8,000 a year versus the 10 or 12. And so I, I just wanted to highlight that. I, I, I don't know if that's, uh, there seems to be this thing out there that, at least for some folks, that we want more, you know, we want to actively get more kids in here when I, I didn't think that was our position, but I'll just leave it there. Thank you. When you come back and talk about sure. it, because it's not agendized. So exactly. Yeah. But okay. yeah. Anybody else have um, board member activities? Um, so okay. It already came up, but I was just going to share that I was at both the new teacher welcome for Phyllis as well as the um, staff kickoff. And um, both of those events were lovely and very well attended and received, I think. Um, and then uh, Los Altos 2x2 two two is tomorrow, so I'll be able to, Jerry and I will be able to give you a report on that after the next one. And then um, just on a, a, a personal note, I know for some of us, um, it was my very last um, first day of school coffee at Montclair, but it was also um, for a lot of people in our community, it was their very first day in one of our schools, and it was just a, a really neat day. So I just wanted to reflect on that just in that little brief way. Satish? Same, uh, yeah, <laughs> same thing. That, no, no, the new teachers and Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Um, Need uh, to welcome all of them. Yeah, so only, yeah, both of us are there. Yeah, so yeah I picked a bad time to be gone. I missed the new teachers and the, yeah. <laughs> Sylvia, anything? Nope, I don't have anything, Craig. No. Nope. Okay, then we're on to agenda setting. Do we have agenda items that we want to suggest? So I just, I know Jerry and I had both requested last year one on libraries. Is that still on your, some sort of update on sure. sort of district-wide what the state of the libraries are? Um, and then I've gotten some questions around sort of what the state is for long, sh short and long-term plans, I guess, around instructional technology. Um, and I don't know that that necessarily came up from a more big picture level last year, so that one is a possible Which one? Uh, sort of okay. capture on where we are at on instructional technology and what our, where we think that's, we had so much that went on around the one-on-one -on -one program and we kind of made a direction that that's not where we're going, but we haven't really said where we are. It may be that it's better incorporated in small pieces and other things, you know, right. as we talk about right. math or right. as we talk about reading, whatever it is. It's just, I feel like that one. And then the other one that I had for the year um, was, and I know you and I worked on this a little bit last spring, was just sort of the state of sort of emergency preparedness. And along those lines, I had requested um, an update on w what we're doing about protocols and training around, especially with all the recent um, on yeah, and, and I should have mentioned that I was going to do that in my uh, update. Uh, so uh, we did meet, Jeff and I met with, uh, yeah, uh, someone from Sumidia and following up with Chris uh, okay. from Sumidia's office and then with, uh, from the emergency, uh, county emergency folks, Dana. So we, it, we're, we're starting to have conversations about given that we are six different jurisdictions, how do we make a cogent emergency plan? It's been a little bit tough when you have different law enforcement, different fire departments, different, right, all, all that. So they actually, they, they clearly had not thought it th through and they said, wow, that really is odd, right? I mean, we, we are a different district uh, compared to others. So we have all the individual pieces in place, yeah. but the big... Exactly, and, and we worry about if something really big were to happen, if, if 
different jurisdictions are responding across our schools and that doesn't serve us, right? So we're, we're a little nervous about that, so we will be working on it and uh, they, we've committed to doing, uh, so what, to answer your question, we will be bringing various things as we move forward and um, I have requested of all of us that we focus a bit on making sure we feel confident that we know what we will do in an emergency. Um, there are some things that we just have to talk about financially to deal with things like the fencing and certain things that we said we would, would do to make all of our schools safe and we, we need to follow up on those things. So we will bring that. Perfect. Anything else for agenda setting? Nope. Okay, then uh, I think we're done. Great, thanks everybody. We're adjourned at 1.35, well done.